We are live, live, live here at Myth Vision Podcast, ladies and gentlemen. You're going to want to get the book, Permission <laughs> Granted by Dr. Jennifer Bird. Thank you for joining me today, Dr. Bird. Thanks for having me back. It's really fun to join you. I am excited. I must tell everybody I've been listening <laughs> to the book on Audible. And like the more that we talk about these issues, the more we dive into this sincerely, like my perception is actually changing. Like I'm actually mm. seeing things I never really mm. paid attention to before. Mm -hmm. And it's thanks to your work and in, in our conversations that made me go, oh. what in the world? Like I read oh. the Bible many times from beginning to end as a young, you know, Christian and right. Yeah. And some of these passages we're going to get into today that are like dark, that are mm -hmm. very like survival of the fittest seemingly difficult stuff i got goosebumps originally and i'd be like yes <laughs> god is right you know like like i mean i'm not yeah. joking like i yeah. legit had the hairs of my arms standing up going yes annihilate the enemies of god if you're against us you know like and i really had that right yeah you were in, yeah, you were you were playing along it was it was working for you right you're on the right side of that story and right I was on the right side and whoever was being annihilated and killed was obviously not. And uh, yep. I do want everybody to take a moment to go get the book permission granted. It is on audible. It is in paperback. Mm -hmm. Please go get you a copy. That is the book we're going to be discussing today. And in case you're wondering if you can doubt or if you can question or if you can reread or you can see problems in the Bible, permissions granted. So you'll see that that's the whole gist of this book. She also has a website, jennifergracebird.com. Go check out her website and her bio's on there. You can see her academic background. I've done many of interviews with you, Dr. Bird. So for those who are tuning in who don't know who you are, please, I, I'd say go to the website or check out our previous interviews. You recently did a debate also on is Christianity logical? We could call modern. it a debate if you want. <laughs> I just retitled it and called it that. I did not expect the direction of the yeah. debate discussion to go the path that it did, but yeah. I'm glad I had two women talking about that issue and not mm -hmm. me. Um, mm -hmm. You also are on Vimeo. People can go and check out your series on the Bible, Marriage in the Bible, and yeah. any other details there. They can go and rent it all or buy all of them for a one-time <laughs> fee. That's right. Um, yeah. It's meant to help groups of people who want to better grasp what the Bible does say about marriage, like work through what the Bible says. I'm, although I do have my own perspective, I'm not trying to convince anyone. I simply want people paying attention. And so this is, uh, it's kind of like 10 bite-sized topics to mm -hmm. listen to a video and then work through the passages and talk about the passages on your own with people you trust. That's the whole point of this series. Um, I did make it with, you know, Methodists and Presbyterians in mind, just to be clear, because there are two denomination, large denominations wrestling with how to handle this. But right. I think it also works, uh, you know, in lots of contexts, you know, for people who want to know what to th say, for instance, to someone about, well, God's, you know, God ordained marriage between a man and a woman. Actually, that's just not true. It's much more complicated. And anyway, so. Yeah, the idea. you also yeah. have a YouTube channel. They can go and subscribe mm -hmm. to your YouTube. I highly recommend everybody go subscribe to Dr. Bird. And then, of course, oh, did you want to say something about Well, I was just going to say, if you go to the playlist, it also is a little more clear at the top. Yeah, because then I've you can see these interviews and then the professional, yes, the academic videos that I've created and then the clips. So, yeah, <clears throat> I'm going to make that my landing page anyway. Yeah, no, I don't know if that would work on yeah. the on the home page so. nope they'd have to go to the playlist but yeah subscribe to her youtube channel and then last of all myth visions uh, patreon i have a video i'm waiting to launch today actually uh it's just processing as we speak nice we're going into uh the letters of paul you know but we're also trying to get like what's on the ground in the first century that's going on between probably mm -hmm. jews and what are called greeks people who called themselves greeks because paul uses a very unique term greek uh, to mm -hmm. the Jew and to the Greek. And it's like not just generic anybody who's non-Jew. It's like yep. people aspired to call themselves Greeks. And there's like this high and mighty, they think they're descended from certain, they have higher, I don't know, status and everything. Jew, uh, Paul's probably, according to Christopher Stanley, 
probably trying to knock them off their high horse. And he's also trying to knock the Jews off their high horse in a way, it seems. Like he's trying to say, oh, you think you're just because you're a descendant of Abraham. Get out of my face. And then also to the Greeks, like, hey, stop. You know, he's trying to humble everybody, I guess. I don't know. There's something interesting here. but There is. I'm glad you interviewed Chris. Yeah. That's yeah, nice. he's written yeah. on Paul for decades. And he's, right. <laughs> he's big, in, as you've mentioned before, you know. He's big into the deep dives there. Go support us on Myth Vision Patreon. Highly recommend you do. You want to see some of the interviews I've done with Dr. Crossan, some of the interviews I've done with uh, with Del Allison. There's much more to come. So anyways, that's our introduction. Dr. Bird, I knew we were getting into some very difficult stuff. Is that my... That's my AC unit. Um, I'm going to end up muting in a second here, but uh, I just want to say fair warning yeah i think it's important to start off right now with a warning for anybody yep. who gets triggered easily some of the stuff mentioned in this um can be triggering there's going to be violent language there's going to be sexual language that's going to be discussed uh, abusive language that's going to be discussed and it's all coming from your also great holy bible and um and, so and not- se- sexual violence although that is actually kind of a not quite accurate label in and of itself because sex and violence anyway don't actually go together but sexual vi- you know it's not just sexual language but also harm in the realm of sex or sexuality so yes important to have the content warning tonight i want to ask my friends who are of the male persuasion uh try to try to put on different lenses uh, it's what I've been doing or trying to do when I listen mm. to what you're saying because it's so easy as a guy. And I'm like, hey, I'm a guy, you know, and I'm reading this because this book's perfect for me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, as the, you, you get what I'm trying to say. Like, I do. Like, it's written for men, by men. Yeah. You know, hey, I, I get the thumbs up at the end of the day on this thing. Yeah. But I made that thumbnail um, and I saw that image and mm-hmm. it looked something like I'd imagine you as like a young teenager reading your Bible. Okay. And at first it's you once again, like me with a, yeah, yeah. Go oh, God. <laughs> yeah. The, Love me some uh, Jesus. Take yeah. all the virgins for some, ah, skip over that and keep going. <laughs> like, and you don't even like get it. You know, you're not like digesting mm-hmm. what it's saying, what it means, what's happening mm-hmm. here in this text. Mm-hmm. And your and book is great. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. It, I try to invite people to do that over and over and over again. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's it's tough. It's tough. So it what do you want to begin with this issue? Because your book tries to obviously show there's a lot going on, even that's misinterpreted by church fathers. I think it's important to start there, right? Um, you didn't do your myth vision intro. I think that I've already kind of yeah, we're oh, kind of like okay. I'm just used to the scrolls and everything. Okay. It's You're okay. Just it's okay. Gentle, a more gentle entry. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I just want to make sure that wasn't I think like the outro will do that. Okay. All right. I just want to make sure you weren't like all caught up in, you know, getting set up that you didn't. Oh, gosh. Okay. So back to what do we want to start with? Oh. Yeah. Well, you did the, you, you point out that I think for you, what really radically started to transform your yes. giving a background to you is you were going into getting a degree. You mm-hmm. were taking this so serious. You were going to college for the Bible and, mm-hmm. and seminary. Stuff. Yep. Mm-hmm. And it was like when you found out that not everybody interprets like original sin and the the woman is to blame for everything and like this interpretation. When you found out there were other ways to understand it, it started to make you go, "What the heck? I didn't know this." Yeah, I. That was a moment of like rate, like deep. Like, I don't know if rage, because I don't think I was feeling rage yet. No, I really was. But yeah, this whole like, wait a minute. What do you mean women weren't created second? And women weren't created to fulfill men, as I have been told and heard and tried to assimilate, you know, like, wait, that's not what the Hebrew is saying? I I have been, and then that just kind of opens up all, I mean, how many times have I heard men mean, well-meaning saying that, you know, like the woman being the helpmeet and women all over the place, teaching it to their daughters and women getting on board with a, like fixing, the, like finding a way to make it okay and finding a way to find their power and their voice within this construct, this belief that women really were second to men and re- really were created 
for men's sake. And, you know, like, I just think of all the church settings I've been in where I've heard people talking about that and not questioning it, you know, that yeah. was a, yeah, that was a big, that was a big moment for me reading the Hebrew for myself and thinking, um, <laughs> excuse Let me. We, we can thank some of the church fathers actually. And, and I'm not blaming anybody and I'm not even blaming history. I mm. think it's mm -hmm. important to know the zeitgeist they lived in and what yeah. they, how they lived, what kind of society August, uh, Augustus or Augustine, I'm sorry. The one. And, uh, Tertullian and these other church fathers who are like, it, you almost wonder, and I mean, I'm making a jab here, kind of a funny joke. Like, could you not get laid or something, dude? Like, like what's your problem of, against women? I, I don't understand. I mean, I'm being, <laughs> no, it's but actually there's, serious. It's like there's a real problem in some of their views of women. Like, have you been turned down your whole life is my point. Mm -hmm. Like, why are you so antagonistic in some of this literature? And yes. then the church has kind of looked at that as, well, you shouldn't eat the fruit and it's your fault. And man was made first. And the Hebrew doesn't say that in, in Genesis 1. It says man in the generic term, like mankind, right. was made. Right. But it never mankind. tells you the sexes. Right. It just talks about a human. A generic human is the way I like to refer to it. And... And then, and th then all the animals are created. And then God, you know, in the story says, hey, wait a minute. It's not good for this human, still just generic, to be alone. And well, and then that's when all the animals are created. And then he's, and then God's like, okay, so none of those animals worked. So let's try this, you know. And then this, the deep sleep, pulling the, there's, there's some fun articles out there in terms of looking at what this piece is out of the side of the body. And, you know, I don't need to get into the specifics of it. I like to look at the meaning, right? And so now that we've taken, you know, one apart into two, that's mm -hmm. when male and female in the Hebrew is introduced. And this does, I, I remember the first time I realized that it, I absolutely went to the place you did, Derek, the story, the Greek story yes. from the symposium, right? Aristophanes version of love is this, this idea that humans, you know, initially God, cre the gods created the humans paired up back to back, right? And we were split apart and some people were paired male, male and female, and some were paired male, male, and some were pa paired female, female. And, you mm -hmm. know, Greeks had this, had this way of acknowledging that kind of a pairing versus marriage between a man or woman, you know? Right. Anyway, it's that's almost that's... like they knew the natural <laughs> inclinations. They paid attention humans... to some things. Yeah. Yeah, that humans had. But then again, I, I can't, uh, I mean, maybe they had other faults, but my point is, is like when you're already, when you're, and I, I think the later motivations for circumcision, there, there may be other meanings earlier on, but there seems to some later motivations are like, let's cut that sensitive phallic organ to desensitize it so that you aren't so about your sexuality and stuff. Like there seems to be some, hmm. some interpretations like this. Hmm. And you kind of wonder like you're fighting against nature, like your own natural, whatever. So I think the, the um, Greeks were right, or at least these particular Greek authors were right on trying to say, Hey, this seems to be the way things kind of crumble. It's the way it is. Mm -hmm. And it's an interesting origin myth that explains why, you know, why Sally Sue and Rebecca are That's over right. there in love. And, That's and right. why Jimmy and Tom are, you know, just That's an right. example. Yeah. Um, rather yeah. than it has to be this way and, you know, kill the guy who isn't like us. Yeah, or exactly. Make fun of, yeah, persecute, torture, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And so that, that version, a diff that what to me was a more freeing version of, the end of chapter two of Genesis, right? It's what is this story getting at? Back to your point, Derek, what is it getting at? What human experiences is it trying to give voice to? And, you know, I remember the first time I, um, when I taught at Greensboro College, there were a lot of adult students there. And I remember talking about, you know, well, this, maybe this story is just, you know, to help comfort the mother, who is sad about her son moving out or her, her daughter, you know, you know like, son, you know, le the, the empty nest syndrome It's to comfort you in that. That's like, this is just a normal part of life for your child to leave. And then this one mother of, you know, older um, children said, or maybe it's just to help kick the kid out of the nest. Like it's your time to get out, you know, like, anyway, um, I guess that was funnier for me than it was. Well, you're me. talking anyway. about the part where it says to leave your mother and father, yes. right? Okay. 
Yes. Sorry, yes. I interrupted no, you. In the no, 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 no. <laughs> it's fine. I, I forget that I need to be more clear about these things. But yes. So after the the a part of the the first human is taken out, and it's now we have male and female are introduced, and now they're being talked about as Ish and Isha, whereas before the first human was created was just Adam, a generic human, and now we have Ish and Isha, and therefore Ish, the male, leaves his parent, his father, and mother, and joins to his Isha. And the two become one flesh. And ev I've looked up, there are more English translations now, but I looked up 50 different English translations recently for the book I'm working on. And all but two, I think, say man and his wife. Mm -hmm. Oh, you mean man and his woman? It says in the Hebrew, man and his woman. Right, Every right, English right. translation says man and his wife. Oh, I thought you said, but like two. All but so maybe two say that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's yeah. see. So, that's why when you asked me originally this, I was just like, "Yeah, a man should leave his mother and father and cleave to his wife." And you were like, "The Hebrew doesn't say wife, so we've already kind of anachronistically put in yes, the meaning right. there, and that's the right. translators as well when it just says woman." Right. In fact, in the entire Hebrew Bible, there isn't a label for wife or husband. It's always, anytime you see husband or wife language in, in your Hebrew Bible translation, it's, it's just man or woman. And mm -hmm. that's a choice that the committee makes, whether or not in this context, we believe this is a married person. And so all of our modern understandings of marriage are then being put onto that story. I mean, I cannot tell you how many times every, almost Almost to a like almost to a person. When I ask students to read through the story in Genesis twelve about Abram and Sarai, and this language of the Pharaoh takes her in as his wife is what the English translation says, and all these people are like, yeah. So that doesn't mean that they had sex. He's just being nice to her. He's taking care of her. He's doing. I'm like, that is such modern understanding of marriage. It's not what's going on here. And I. And it's like, it never gets old. People, every every term, I get to say it over and over again. It's like, no, yeah, it's understandable. You read your own understandings of marriage onto this, but that's not what's going on here. And, and I think that if we would have more honest translations, especially on this topic, it would make it easier for people to see that the Bible is talking about a different thing than we are. And I think that's an important place to start on that conversation about marriage. But but even just in talking about relationships, which people of faith turn to these patriarchs and matriarchs as examples, right, to follow. Mm. And and anyway, so even Selah uh, a few weeks ago corrected me in that when we were referring to a passage in the Newer Testament that you know, I, it's, she said husband and wife or man and wife or whatever. And I was like, no, it's, it's man and woman in the, in the Greek, because also the Greek does not have a label for man, uh, husband or wife. In fact, if I can say one more thing here, Derek, mm -hmm. there isn't even a verb to marry in the Hebrew Bible. Like there isn't a verb to marry. It is always to take. So in the, so you could just put in Mary into like Bible Gateway or something and look at and anytime you see language about a man marrying a woman. No, he's the verb is lakach to take. He's taking her. It's not do you take this man as your wife, your husband, and do you take this woman as your wife? No, it's I'm going to go physically remove her from her family. Sometimes I'll pay for her. <laughs> Some of the men pay for yeah. her. I so think we'll get into some of that too. Okay. Sorry. I'm getting ahead of no, us. No, no, I just, no, no. I just, you know, it's just the language itself. If we could, if the, if the translations were a little bit more raw, I think it would be helpful for people to, it would enable people to see a little bit better that, yeah, they are thinking about things. They were thinking about things differently. And like you said, it isn't that I'm trying to blame them for being ancient people speaking in the way they thought about things. It's just that when we're, when so many people want to base, you know, their lives or their belief systems or even want to force things on like our country or something <laughs> mm -hmm. um, based on these scriptures. But you but you're not respecting what the scripture is actually getting at. Like, that's the frustration for me. Right. right. It's not that I'm angry at them for being the patriarchal misogynistic bleep bleeps. It's that let's be honest about that. That's what was going on. So that when we're reading these texts, we can be a little more conscientious about 
from whom we are receiving these these writings and these ideas. There's so much to cover. Um, so just letting everybody know, thank you for your super chats that are already coming in. I'm going to let oh. them build up as we get into this first, because once again, another warning, we're going to get into things that we've slowly edged our way into here. Um, I want to mention a couple things. I interviewed a scholar who was a supplementary hypothesis kind of uh, scholar, okay. and he wrote a book called Why Abraham Murdered Isaac. Okay. And he believes that there's redactions and you can see kind of the names of God change throughout narratives that look funny. Huh. And it looks like they're kind of covering up a problem. Sure. Even the Bible we have, as we know, it has yeah. been dabbled, like tampered with. Sure. Absolutely. Um, we don't have anything, pre you know, any documentation right. to show. We, we, what we have is like the finalized form of what we've got. But in here, I, I hope that makes some sense here. I, I'm Here's, tracking. Mm -hmm. So, in this Abraham story, he takes Sarah to, you know, into Egypt and your book doesn't beat around the bush. Like <laughs> Egypt, the Pharaoh thinks it's his sister. The Pharaoh has sex with Sarah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. period. And yeah. you ask the question I never really asked because it doesn't, you know, I'm a guy, right? So it's like, why are we asking this question? But you asked the question and it made me think like, I wonder if if this was historical, because that's another big question mark. Sure. sure. Uh, this could just be a narrative, but nonetheless reflective of what was happening in reality yes, whenever this exactly. was written. Right. So what was her first night there put into a predicament that she didn't even have a choice in? What, what would it have been like with this Pharaoh? Then he goes further, though, because our Bible tells another story where he goes to another king and the same thing happens again. Mm -hmm. And it it literally this scholar says is trying to cover up yep. that that man had sex with her. It's like, mm -hmm. Oh, he did, but he did not lie with her. Mm -hmm. And in the Hebrew, it's confusing because the Hebrew says he took her mm -hmm. and then it's trying to say, well, he didn't take her. And so mm -hmm. the actor, this guy says, right. is trying to like, because the next scene after, after this, Abraham's taking Isaac up onto a mountain. Mm -hmm. Like it's not far after this scene. When right. This no, it's Genesis 20 is the second version. And Genesis 21 is when he, or 22. Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but this this exactly. is an interesting thing to think about because it's like, did this redactor, whoever these authors who are fixing up the Bible are noticing, hold on, Isaac could be the child of this other man and not Abraham because this is why they made a covenant. You know, let's, let's be good between your people and my people. The next scene, here's Abraham on a mountain trying to kill him. Okay. So I don't know if this guy's <laughs> right, but he's saying there might be a Game of Thrones movie to be had here in the Bible for sure about why Abraham was sacrificing Isaac. And notice after he goes to sacrifice him, but gets told not to, mm -hmm. Isaac doesn't show up in, in the narrative again. And then when he shows up, it's a re like a repetition of Abraham's life. So this scholar's like, Isaac looks like they just copied and pasted Abraham's life in the narrative to connect Abraham to Jacob. Like mm -hmm. Isaac is a filler, almost like he's a non-existent person <laughs> that they created a life for to connect Abraham to Isaac or to Abraham or Jacob. Jacob. Sorry, but mm -hmm. you get the. I don't. That was really complex, and he goes into his book why Abraham uh, murdered Isaac. But you think about it, and Sarah had no say in any of this. And then, of That's course. Right. That's right. Look at Isaac's story. He does the same thing with his woman. Uh huh. It's the right. same thing. It's the same. She yeah. Apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Hmm. Mm. Or just this is a thing we do as a way, one of the ways we make treaties with our neighbors or we make nice with these people in power, right? We hand over our women because they're our property. And we're not going to hear what the women have to say about the story. We're going to be hearing your voice today. I think it's important, your voice, and of course, reflecting the voice in the Bible of the women and mm -hmm. try to have people who are watching get a different perspective. So I'll get to the super chats, but I think it's important we start somewhere. Maybe we can get into Sodom and Gomorrah mm -hmm. uh, with the daughters of Lot. Maybe we can get into Jephthah's daughter. Maybe we can get mm -hmm. into um, the woman who is raped all night to death. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe we can get into, I mean, and the list goes on in your book and I had no, I knew, but I did, you kind of really let it sink in and you're like, 
whoa, or Hosea and the language that God uses. So I'm teasing people, but also warning people, if you're triggered mm -hmm. easily, you're mm -hmm. going to want to turn this off and probably not watch this live. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Which, um, which do you want to talk about next? I get, I, I need to stop doing my little, I'm up, you know, it's difficult. I'm yours. I'm, I'm all yours. <laughs> you wanna, so like, mm. I want to allow you to kind of fill it out and go wherever you feel comfortable. I think for some reason I want to start with Hosea because I, uh, because that's God hmm. and it's not just the men doing horrific things to other people, but it's, it's God actually threatening. So, so thinking of your, you titled this one, you know, what's the worth of a woman in the Bible. And I, when I posted the link on, on Facebook, I, I was a little late, even though, you know, posting it and someone, and I, I do love it when this happens because it's like, it's a good reminder. I, my first thought was, okay, are there good things in the Bible? Jen, think about it. Quick, quick, quick. You know, like, don't, right. don't dismiss that there might be some good, you know, like Proverbs, Proverbs. There's some positive things said about women in, you know, in Proverbs. And the first thing that popped in my head was, um, charm is deceptive and beauty is vain. Do you know the song, Derek? No, but I bet every Christian woman does. But a woman I, you who broke up for a second there. You broke up for a second. Did I? Oh, but a woman who fears the Lord's to be praised. Like that's the song that goes in my head. Oh, talking about the positive things about women in the Bible. Anyway, we could talk about that, but I don't want to. What, why is a woman who fears the Lord to be praised? We could talk. Yeah, we could pick that apart. Right. But this got me off. So the, when I posted on Facebook, someone someone just said, "As precious as rubies." more precious than jewels. That's what this guy posted when I posted that we're having this conversation about what is a woman's worth. And I just thought, you know, I get that. I get that he thinks that that's a really good thing. I think that this person who said that thinks that comparing women to jewels is nice. And you know, I got to tell you, the, there are a few words that just get under my skin and precious is one of them. <laughs> And it's because of this. It's because of this kind of language around women and isn't that, you know, women are precious. And I'm trying not to swear on your, on your, on these podcasts, but like I, if I were swearing, I'd be saying, you know, like, right. Anyway, so I, it's interesting. What, what are, what's the worth of women? Why are we, why are we being compared to jewel? Are men compared to jewels in the Bible? I don't think so. That's interesting. But, a great worth, a woman of great, a woman of great strength is of great worth. I think that's true. And I think that's good. And actually wisdom is compared to, is better than jewels at the beginning mm -hmm. of Proverbs and a strong woman is of great worth. I think that's true. And I love that. I think that's lovely. The problem is that the other pieces that come along with that in that, in that Proverbs 31 thing about women. Um, but I also want to come back around and say, isn't that a bit of an overcompensation? Are you, are you trying to say that women are just so valuable in compensation for the fact that you've been stomping on our necks, you know, for thousands of years? Like you do, do you know what I'm saying, Derek? Yeah. With, oh, yeah. Is this comparison kind of like putting women on a pedestal? I don't like, I can't move very well on a pedestal. Don't put me there. You know, um, not a fan of pedestals. So anyway, uh, so I think there are a few positive things about women and women's worth. And there are stories about women in the Bible. I just want to be sure I'm true to the topic you gave this. So people aren't like frustrated that I wasn't, do, that we're not doing, being more clear or more comprehensive. I, but, I think it's going to be transparent that you're trying to make the point kind of like when I say, you know, Christians need to stop saying this. And then one of my Christian buddy goes, Derek, I'm a Christian. I don't say that. And it's like, oh, you're universalizing. So you're trying to paint everything is bad and everything. Right. And you're not trying to do that, but you are trying to say, here's some neglected stuff that yes. I don't even think you realize that the Bible teaches the, people, right. the men, the men who wrote these books teach. And you mentioned Hosea, if I may, if yeah. I may, let's go there. I just want to let's go there. But I want to say I used to read this and get yes. goosebumps. I want. Yeah. I and do you remember what gave you goosebumps about it? Yeah, because <laughs> it wasn't because I could relate to the what, what I now look at it as, you know, like, <laughs> like it's like I was That's reading good. it. I'm like, OK, you know what? I'm starting with I'm worthless. And I don't mean it like, a, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. when people look at Christianity and the teachings, it's like 
I am this little thing and I'm just, why is God, you know, love me? And that kind of idea that Christianity tries to teach that we're really not worthy of his grace and his right. mercy and we deserve right. his punishment. Right. And so I'm reading Hosea and I'm thinking, you know, I was wandering in the world and right. going after the false gods and right. idols of the world, etc. Right. Mm -hmm. So then God gives this man, Hosea, a mission to go marry a prostitute, a, mm -hmm. a sex worker. Mm -hmm. Because, well, his people, like me, not worth it, not worthy, right? just right. scum of the scum. earth. I was just going to say that, scum of the earth. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. um, just like this prostitute woman, right? Here's a sex worker being looked at as the lowest of the totem pole. And uh, you're going to go and you're going to take her, take her, all right, as your mm -hmm. wife. Yeah, as your um, woman. Yeah, I, I see here, I already throw in the no, term. Mm -hmm. Um but then she's going to do you dirty because this is what she does. Right. <laughs> but you're going to, you're going to look past that. You're mm -hmm. going to show mercy and you're going to buy her back when she's worthless, when she's no one wants to buy her anymore. And she's not got her beauty anymore. And she's pretty much, she's not of any value anymore. Right. So now you have to go and spend what you have left in buying her back as if God is doing this for his, his people, Israel. And Israel is the female in this story. Then I came across your book. <laughs> <laughs> so that's when you can come in and tell us what's happening here. The language that mm -hmm. God uses, which I like that you said, let's leave humans out of the mix for a moment. Let's deal with the portrayal of God in Hosea. Yeah. Yeah. And the other like caveat or thing I want to preface this with is I also hear a lot of people say, I just believe the Bible. Like a lot of really good, loving, loving people say, I just believe the Bible because it's my, you know, and th this is what comes to mind. When I hear someone say that, what comes to mind are the things listed in chapter five, which is violence, the story, of, the language everyone understands. And, th and these stories, right? The stories in Judges that you just referred to. And this passage in Hosea, which is God, right? So... Do, do you want me to read parts of the, I, I'm it. all about, I think it's helpful sometimes to hear the language, but I won't read the whole thing, but the, the beginning. So you did summarize nicely what, you know, what's going on at the beginning. But um, when the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, the prophet, go take for yourself a wife of whoredom. I just think that it's funny that that's a thing, right? Go take for yourself a wife of whoredom. So as you said, marry sex worker and have children of whoredom. Isn't that great? For the land commits great whoredom by forsaking the Lord. So the one thing I just want to comment on is that all these different, like the, don't get sidetracked, don't get sidetracked, Jen. But okay. the people, the people are being called whores, right? So Israel, because they are worshiping other gods, are being called whores. So we could have an entire conversation about why does anyone ever, at any point in history, when they want to denigrate someone or or give them the worst like judgment of all is is a sexualized form negative sexualized form of a woman right mm -hmm. a whore why is that the best uh you know you know what i'm saying like why is that the best judgmental thing to say you're I mean, right book of revelation right exactly like, this guy hates rome you can yes. tell Yes. The best language he could come up with, the yes. most curse worded language right. he could come up with is the whore of Babylon. Exactly. For this, for these right. people. So for yes, the city. yes. Right. Why is that? But, but so here's the thing. Like, why does why is anyone surprised when that when that, that that's still happening today? That people will right? I mean, this this language, language is powerful. Language is really powerful. And that's why it that's why I wanted to pause on that language. But you were asking me to get to move on to the part about. You know, he names the children like you're not my people and not no mercy and then changes it back. But let's the, the part that the part that's so unsettling for me is chapter two of Hosea. And I to be honest, it's been a very long time since I've read the whole book. And I've mm -hmm. had students ask, why do you stop at chapter two? Because it gets worse as you keep going. Because like, chapter two is awful. I can't like I I have to steal my stomach so that I don't start crying mm. when I read this. It makes it is so upsetting to me. Um, so it's all com it's a little convoluted, but in chapter two, say to your brothers, so Hosea, the, the father is saying to his children, go talk to your 
go talk to your siblings plead with your mother plead so the mother in this case is gomer the woman who had been a sex worker who's been purchased to make a point that's the other thing that's the other thing about this is this is a symbolic action that hosea is doing and his action of taking this woman hosea or uh, gomer is a message to israel and a woman a woman is being used to make a to make a point to the people who cares about her life? Who cares about the children that they bring into the world? Who cares about that? I need, you know, God needs to make a point, right? So plead with your mother, plead for she is not my woman and I am not her man. Plead that she put away her whoring from her face and her adultery from between her breasts or I will strip her naked and expose her as in the day she was born. And I will make her like a wilderness and turn her into a parched land and kill her with thirst. Upon her children also, I will have no pity. I mean, this is God speaking through Hosea, saying these, saying these things and the, the things that are being said to Gomer or said about her represent Israel. So God, in this convoluted it's way, these so are his special people yes, that right. talking about like this. Right. Yeah. And God is saying to Israel, essentially, what Hosea is saying to Gober is me to you. I'm going to strip you naked and expose you in the day as in the day you were born. Upon her children, I also have no pity because they were children of whoredom, which, by the way, God told her told to happen anyway, for their mother has played the whore. How many times have we had the word whore in this chapter? Yeah. She who conceived them has acted shamefully. We could talk about the fact that she only acts shamefully because men pay her. But anyway, for she said, I will go after my lovers and give my, and, and they give me my bread and my water, my wool and my flax, my oil and my drink. Therefore, I, God is saying, will hedge up her way with thorns and I will build a wall against her so that she cannot find her paths. She shall pursue her lovers, but not overtake them. And she shall seek them, but shall not find them. Then she shall say, I will go and return to my first man. For it was better with me then than now. She did not know that it was I who gave her the grain, the wine, and the oil, and who lavished upon her silver and gold that they, that they used for Baal. Therefore, I will take back my grain in its time and my wine in its season, and I will take away my wool, my flax, which were to cover her nakedness. No, now I will uncover her shame in the sight of her lovers. That's a euphemism for have sex with. I am going to have sex with her in front of her lovers, and no one shall rescue her out of my hand. Someone is going to want to. They're going to watch her get raped, and they... She can't, nobody's going to be able to help her, that right. kind of thing. Yes. I will put an end to all her mirth, her festivals, her new moons, her Sabbaths, and all her pointed festivals. I will lay waste her vines and her fig trees, of which she said, these are my pay, which my lovers have given me. I will make them a forest and the wild animals shall devour them. I will punish her, blah, blah, blah. Therefore... I will now allure her and bring her into the desert and speak tenderly to her. From there, I will give her her vineyards and make the Valley of Acor a door of hope. There, she shall respond. We're talking sex here, right? She shall respond as in the days of her youth, as at the time when she came out of the land of Egypt. Okay, how many things did we just read through? I'm going to kill her with thirst. I'm going to make her like a desert. These are the things that God is saying to Israel through Hosea and Gomer. Here's the thing. The reason this makes me so upset every time is that in case you can't tell, this is an abusive relationship. He is going to block, keep her from what, you know, in a stereotypical male, female, you know, relationship when the male is the one being abusive, it doesn't always happen that way. But just as a example, what are the things that happen in an abusive relationship? They in particular want to keep the the woman away from her friends, keeping, mm -hmm. isolate her. The more you can isolate her, the more control you have over her and control is, is key here, right? You, you, there's a lot of gaslighting that takes place. You blame her for your anger at her. It's all her fault. 
it's all her fault. And then after all of the anger and vehemence and throwing people around or whatever, then you speak tenderly and you say, I'm sorry, baby, it won't ever happen again. After making threats and endless derogatory slanders. And raping at her. Or, and beating or whatever. Right. Yes, which is what we just saw. He's going to strip her naked. He's going to kill her with thirst. He's going to rape her in front of people. And and you deserve it because of what you've chosen to do instead of being true to me. You know, I mean. And let's be honest here. Uh, so two things I, I think is important for those who are like, well, we've really went deep in this already. I want to try and like rest your rest assured many people that, um, you know, this is Hosea talking or at least whoever this mm -hmm. author is that's mm -hmm. saying they're Hosea, yeah. the author. Yeah. Um, this if you believe in a God, I hope that this is not your God. Exactly. Um, I hope you understand these are men. And this is why I love the title of your book. Just to bring that up on the screen one more time for people to understand. You're going to notice as she goes through it, and I hope you will all get the book, that she'll end something tough like this and then say, you know, you don't have to believe that this is God. Permission granted. Okay? Mm -hmm. Like, permission granted to, to question these things, to right. say, men wrote this. And right. there are things you can pick and choose if you're a believer. If you're someone who's not who's skeptical, like these are things you recognize, you see problems with, and you say, this right. is of human origin. This is a right. reflection of a man. We get right. it. This is right. obviously not God. Uh, so yes. whatever way you want to slice it, it, it becomes the problem for people who are the fundamentalist who have to swallow everything and can't parse through. And they have a specific interpretive method and the way right. they view scripture, inerrancy, infallibility, the whole nine, this is the kind of stuff that becomes a problem. I wanted to say when one of the reasons I chose to include Hosea in, in the book permission granted is because I, I was on a women's retreat in college and this passage, the woman who was the keynote speaker chose to use the Hosea, use Hosea for the weekend. And what she mm -hmm. said was, women, look at this. We are so valuable and important to God that God would use us to give this really important message to Israel. And, and at the time, I was very much of a mindset of making anything in scripture work because I believed that it was all in Aaron. It was all from God to me. And I had to, I had to leave. And I didn't at the time understand why I had to leave. It literally took me years before I <laughs> looked back at that and was like, because it's awful. <laughs> And she was doing a marvelous job of making it work, of ignoring the abuse, of ignoring that this is classic abusive relationship behavior, right? That's being projected onto God. Don't think that's who God actually is, you know, mm -hmm. but, but projected onto and, and was being accommodated. And we were being affirmed for putting up with abuse like this to make a point anyway. So... That's why when I'm sitting here talking with you, Derek, it's really important to me to make it very clear how awful it is so that yeah. people, to, to invite people to just sit with that, don't excuse it away, just sit with it. Let it be as awful as it is, right? No, don't oh. let that be. I don't want you worshiping a God that acts like that, that makes that kind right. of a threat. Right, right, right. I agree, and I'm hoping more people because people want to imitate their God. They want right. to imitate the thing that they're particularly yeah. looking up to. Right. Exactly. Right. We exactly. We give the qualities that we most admire to the gods. There was something else you just said that I wanted to mm, shoot. Anyway. Do we, do we, yeah, this get... says, this says more about Hosea. This says more about the writer. That's what you, you had said. And I wanted to reemphasize it. This tells us more about the writers and therefore, and the way they handle anger then it tells us about anything about God. But it's really concerning to me, right? That there are also in Ezekiel chapter six, 16, there are 13, God does the same thing. They, The writer of Ezekiel does the very same thing as what's happening here. God, you know, God's like, I saw you when you're first born and I took you up and I gave you everything. And then, and 13 times calls it a whore in that chapter, right? So this tells, you know, it's not like it's a one thing, but this throughout the whole book of Hosea. But, you know, my point is this tells us about the men or the people writing the stories down or writing these things down. It's not I don't think this tells us who God is. But that then for me is the seed that's planted also, because then I want to stop and think about, well, you know, I, I know men who are abusive and they can be good and kind people in at times in their lives. But they also have this thing. 
And so I need to be careful about this thing, right? This part of them. And so in what way then is the, is that issue that we're seeing very clearly here then also maybe seeping into other parts that it's not quite as clear, but it's still informed by a very dominant, right? A, do you see what I'm saying? Like a, a very oh, yeah. different way of seeing relationships than what we think of today as being healthy and loving and supportive. The way I'm connecting everything you're saying is we still use in our language. It's kind of coded into the way we've used language today. Man, you play ball like a girl, right? The totally. common, almost not as offensive, but it's like a, you know, it's like a you, two boys are talking yep. and you play like a girl, right? And it's a slant, a slant or slander, if you will, at the guy because he slander. can't play uh, like a guy, right? But well, he's never seen me throw the, a football. The mm -hmm. point I'm trying to get at is no. <laughs> you're breaking up a little by the way oh okay gotcha not sure there you go you're back you're back oh, um gosh. but you, you kind of look at the bible you see this language and it, if you notice a lot of the language when it becomes derogatory it's it's always using a a, a gender towards the feminine gender often not, not always, always wisdom but... is equated is yeah, but I thought about the New Testament church for a second here is the bride of Christ, which gets purchased. He takes his bride. Um, this language is there as well. And I didn't know if there was anything there as far as this idea, because oh, yeah. if oh, yeah. I'm going to be honest, I'm re reading Revelation. It talks about these 144,000 virgins. Male, by I the way. Male virgins, right. Yeah, going to marry the lamb who is Jesus, by the way. <laughs> right. I'm confused a bit by all of it, by the way, yeah. honestly. Why the but church has any issue with homosexuality? Yeah. <laughs> I always wondered that too. Like, are you not going to be a man when you, when you go to heaven or anything? So I guess you're okay with that, right? Um, where do you draw the line? But yeah, I thought about that too. And I'm like, okay, there's something, maybe there's something here. When I yes. interviewed Cel uh, Celine Lilly, she's like one of the, um jesus seminar oh, okay. deans or something okay. like that okay she went into this stuff and was going into nakamati literature and showing the rape of eve and she was explaining she wrote a book called the rape of eve and she's going into the language of feminine and even said like rome was the impenetrable which is why they crucified pierced penetrated the enemies of rome they wanted to be the male, the dominant, the controller, and it's a patriarchal society. So all of our language has been kind of formed and has developed from these things. Yes. I think I see a connection, at least to some extent, with what you're describing here biblically Absolutely. and this constant putting down using a feminine. Yes. If that makes and sense, like a feminine uh, term. Yeah. And I'm actually working on my chapter on Ephesians 5, the Bride of Christ piece that you just referenced. It's in a current first Corinthians 15, but it's also in Ephesians five that, you know, that, so I'm actually working on that right now. And the one thing I want to throw into what you just said is the purity piece that the bride is pure and holy and is cleansed by Christ and the bride, the church is the bride. And that is the model for the females. And Christ is the model for males in, in this marriage language and goodness. Yeah. Like we need some help, you know, sorry, I, not going to be sarcastic. So purity language, right? And this issue of virginity. Right. And even in Revelation, what is it that makes this men, these men pure, right? They haven't been tainted by what, putting their penis in somebody else. Um, but this idea of purity, sexual or otherwise, but it's implied sexual, even when it comes to the bride of Christ and the church. Even metaphorically speaking, I, yeah. I take the revelation scene. It could be taken literal because there were sex of Christians who wanted to live kind of no sex at all kind yes. of lives. And you sure. could interpret revelation sure. as that. The sure. other way I understood it is here's this whore of Babylon, Rome. And by the way, he's making Rome feminine. I'm not yes. so sure Rome would like that because <laughs> Rome had, Rome right? had statues, right? Yeah. Where they, yeah. they I mean, always had an uh, emperor who yes. was holding a, a slave woman uh -huh. under duress, whether a right, knife right. or whatever, in a dominant sexual yes. rape position. Yep. So here is this jab back at this masculine country calling her a whore yep. and then saying stuff like, if you eat or if you're buying or whatever, you're going to have this mark. Mm -hmm. That, I think, is where that virgin language is coming in. Like you're participating. You're committing adultery, kind of like Hosea. Mm -hmm. I think Hosea is kind of an analogy of saying, look, all these things you have toward Baal, 
right? It's metaphorical language, oh, sure. but but there's a reality to this as well. Exactly. And it's like, what the heck? It's, it's bad language. And we're over here saying this is the highest standard by which we can live these holy texts that we're yeah. teaching our children and continuing and to do. I don't know. Yeah. And I, yeah, I also have a different issue on the verge. I, I think your points are absolutely spot on, by the way. So I, I don't want to take away from that. But no, I also please. think that the idea of virginity is it's important to me to raise that because virginity is actually just a human construct. It's not an actual state of a woman's body, right? We talk about it that way, mm -hmm. but it's just a, it's just a thing guys made up. Please, You're please educate us guys. Okay. So from what I understand and correct me, right. The idea is that from what we all understand is that, it's this, a woman has a hymen for, from what I understand is that there's this protective barrier, if I will, that, uh, is, is there. And of course it pops when the virginity is, um, penetrated, if you will, or their, their hymen is penetrated. It doesn't so, have to. Yeah. So there's actually a, a, a doctor, a gynecologist did a really interesting video on what a hymen is act actually is, but to, I'll keep it short. The, the hymen is, is a membrane and you can just kind of work it a little bit, make sure it's ready to be, to take in something larger than it's had to deal with, which usually before you're having your period, before you're having sex, uh, we won't get into that. But so norm so you've really just been having a flush happen once a month, right? And, and so the hymen just has to deal with that coming through. But when it's about to take in something larger, the first time, if it hasn't been prepared, if it's kind of snuck up upon, then it often tears, but it is actually incredibly um, elastic and can, you know, be prepared to be penetrated, if you will, to be prepared to, to open up. And so the mark of virginity that people think of is a woman bleeding, but that is actually indication that she has endured violence. Mm. Yeah, it doesn't. Ha a woman doesn't have to bleed during sex ever. And um, yeah, we could talk about anal. I don't want to talk about anal, but like sometimes that happens just because it's thinner skin. But my point is, right? We have stories in the, you know, the reference in the Hebrew Bible talking about here's the mark of her virginity. See, she bled on the sheets. Like, it, oh, I can't think about it too much because I'm going to either no, start screaming or crying. Right? It's just, right, it's right. like, you know, it's a woman's body. Like the the kind of value that people are putting on a woman and her body and whether or not a man has had something to do with it is stunning. It is stunning yeah. to me. The passage right? brought up in your, and it's not just your book, right? We've heard these passages in our Bibles, but you, the way you do it in your book is why I'm really wanting to, again, pressure if I can, if I can <laughs> force you to buy Should the read book. read a passage so people can I hear need the to language? Read the Bible, hallelujah. <laughs> I think people will start being pressured to buy the book. Um, but seriously, in your book, you talk about this passage. You talk about the places where um, men, women, and uh, women who do not have their virginity, right? Because, like, their value's gone. So right. I'm going to get to Super right. Chats in just a moment. But I did want to mention um, briefly, in, in light of these virginity passages – there's this idea of one of the characters, and I don't know if it was Jacob or if it was Abraham, one of these, their daughter, like, was raped. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. they're, like, ready to make a covenant between households or something like mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. and, and almost like there's a purchase. They're worth something. And, I mean, in the literal sense, there is a fee on yes. Yes. this. A bribe so price. when I said, what is a woman's worth? Yes. Maybe we could touch on that for a second before we get to Super Chats. Yes. Okay. So a woman, a young woman can be sold for more by her father to a man if she is a virgin. And so when a man has sex with a woman because they talk about it as something that a man does to a woman, mm. pay attention to that when you hear people talking about sex. It's something a man is doing to a woman. It's not something the couple is enjoying. Shouldn't surprise us that some people to this day actually think of sex that way. Um, anyway, yeah, if, if a man has sex with a woman, then she is not as valuable. She literally has lost value. So her father can't sell her for as much. And that's why there's an accommodation for this. If a man rapes a woman, 
again, the question about these these labels is worth raising. Uh, anyway, so this this issue, the bride price is different, right? She a man, a father. It, and when a man rapes a, a, a woman, it isn't the woman he's offending. It's the father who is a, who this is an offense to because I'm mean, not the, saying the woman isn't actually offended. The point right. is in the, that in the matter text, in the Bible. Right. in the texts, it doesn't matter. Yeah. It's literally the father has been his property right. point blank is devalued. has been devalued. Yep. And now he's stuck with either having to take care of this property right. for the rest of his life. Because he can't well, yeah, unload right. it to, on some guy because they're not going to want to. Who wants tainted goods? Yeah. Yeah. The rape, the rape of Dina or Dinah is the one you're talking about, the passage you're talking about. And um, I don't necessarily need to get into that. But I do want to say that I find that story really fascinating because it's again, it's from a male perspective. They are saying that she is raped. It doesn't, the story itself doesn't uphold that she's raped. Um, you, a man typically does not rape a woman and then, and then declare their love for her, right? What, what happens in a rape is what we see between Amnon and his half sister Tamar, which mm -hmm. is he, so he lures her in, he rapes her, and then he's like, get out of my sight, right? I hate you, right? That's, or that's she's even trying to say no the whole time, it's, too. Totally, like, no, totally. No, no, yes, no. Yes, And she's like, right. just ask dad. He'll, he'll give me to you, you know? Right, right, right. Awful stuff. But my point is, even, <laughs> it's just fascinating to me that this story about Dina is really, again, it's a story about the men. It, they they use this idea that this prince Shechem, you know, is has raped their daughter, and that's gonna that gives them reason to go in and kill them all, you know. And it's not even clear in the story that that's that it wasn't consensual. It's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, recently I interviewed Kip Davis, and uh, he talks about this whole spilling of the seed, which you get into in your book. He thinks that it's actually riffing on something in the David story. And so there's something to do with the names that are similar in Hebrew, hmm. and there's something going on. But it's this hmm. idea that the father can't quite protect the offspring or something, and David couldn't protect his household. And, like, there's some parallel here. Hmm. I am butchering it. Just keep <laughs> beginning to try. I'm like, it, I'm really curious about the parallel. Oh, it's great. It, it's it, it's horrible. But I'm saying, like, it's a great uh, – wow, he saw that and there was a connection there. Interesting I thought, dive, wow. Yeah. But this is your dynasty. Uh, if you think about this, this is your sacred dynasty, and here's this literature, and you're saying, yeah, my – like you're dogmatic and I'm speaking to the fundamentalist here. You're dogmatic running around with this is your literature of your sacred, holy literature that you, you hold on this pedestal. And then you have to ask yourself, or you have to say, you don't even ask yourself. I don't even think they ask themselves this. They go, you just want to sin. And that's why you don't believe in this stuff. And no, when you start to evaluate this and you look mm -hmm. at this material, you mm -hmm. find the problems, you start realizing why do I think this is true? Yeah. Why do I believe in this God? And I'm just speaking as someone who's recognizes pro these problems. Mm -hmm. I don't see why people would, after being able to critically assess this material, That's believe right. in those things. So even John right. Dominic Crossan came on and John said, I don't believe Deuteronomy is accurate. I don't believe in the God of that Deuteronomy. I don't believe in the God of this book. And I don't believe in the God mm -hmm. of that. But right. I believe in the God that I could find in this place, in that place. And it's like cherry picking, but he's, he's honest honest in saying like, this is horrible. That's a bad God. This is not good. Don't believe in this. Right. And then and then he finds ways to like, I think he butters up some stuff. Okay, obviously. But, sure. but I can respect someone who's at least conforming to what we see in reality is bad. And our modern ethics and such, et cetera. So, yes. And back to your the comment that you made that someone would say you just want to sin, and that's why you don't want. Actually, no. I actually am not big into sinning. Uh, I'm big into kindness and love and generosity. And I need some positive. I need some good role models. I, I don't need to. I don't need to have to sort through and sift through whether this is a good example or not. And it mm -hmm. right. I was. I have spent too much time making accommodating horrific stuff abusive stuff, dominating stuff, whatever. And you know what I mean? So it's when someone says that, I, I just get really, I get a little bit fed up. I'm like, actually, I'm not more prone to sin than to goodness. You don't know me. And it offends me that you'd make that claim yeah. about me. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> and, and that's because the, they, they're mind readers, of course. Right. Um, but I want to make one statement and then let's get to Super Chats if you don't mind. Okay, and sure. then we'll bounce Whatever. back to uh, Jeffa's daughter, bounce back to okay. the woman who dies from an all nighter. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. kind of stuff that was just okay. crazy. I've never heard, like never sunk in how insane mm. some of this is in our Bible. Um, if we just had many, many more women commentators, women scholars, I think it would be the Achilles Hill on a whole nother level to fundamentalism. The eye that they have for seeing this, I've never heard anyone catch these details so powerfully as listening to women who are studying and are scholars in the field, like actually digging into the Bible. Um, and I'm not just saying like an apologist, right? They're just kind of practicing a tradition and they're regurgitating what they're taught and told. I'm speaking like permission granted, think for yourself. And that's exactly what your book does. So did you want to make a comment? And then of course I'll go to super chats. No, I I'm, I'm taking your lead here. Cause I'm, yeah, I feel like I'm just kind of along for the ride, whatever. Well, I don't want to, I don't want to no. take control. I want to allow freedom well, to just be yourself and say what you want to say. So, yeah, no, I don't I mean, want to take this <laughs> entire episode. <laughs> that's good. That's good. That's good. That's good. I'd rather let you like, yeah. you know, go no, where you I, feel. I think one of the things I would do want to say is as I'm talking with you, Derek, I'm very, I'm, I'm pretty transparent and I'm pretty honest because I think it's important to be honest. And with, in this book, I'm also honest, but, but I'm much more gentle because yeah. I think when it's you and I can have a conversation or I can have a conversation with someone else and we and I can, you know, be in that dynamic, whatever that conversation needs. But since I'm not actually present and that's, you know, it was really important to me to be calm and to be respectful and, to I'm not trying to convince I'm simply trying to invite people to sit with ideas deeply or sit with them so I wanted to say that about the book and and that was actually one of the reasons why I wanted to be the one to do the reading for the audio because I've had some people misread my tone understandably because we we read through our own lenses right so if you if you tend to be a snarky person you might actually see some of my comments as being snarky when actually I don't intend at all I'm I'm trying to be quite genuine um so that was one of the reasons I read it but then my point here is I I just think um I want people to know that you, you're not going to get this version of me in the book you get a yeah. much more invitational hey let's just chat about this for a bit here you know so you do that in the introduction of your book too. You, you said, well, thank you to so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so and saying like fix the attitude. Like you said to adjust your attitude in a way yeah. in this tone, in your tone or whatever. So yeah. thank you. Doc Pleroma not good hey. to see you in the chat. Doc. <laughs> thank you for the super chat. Probably the more difficult question of the day. Probably dangerous sisters as destabilizing figures are seen in Dina versus Rebecca or Miriam's transformation. Is this an intentional ca cautionary construct to protect a patriarch defined world or are modern heroic views being imposed? Okay. All right. So da dangerous sisters, destabilizing figures are seen in Dina versus Rebecca. Mm -hmm. So Dina doing her own, trying to do her own thing versus Rebecca, who is one of the least like, does Rebecca have any lines at all? You know, like Isaac's woman, uh, well, yeah, she does. She she teams up against Isaac, doesn't she? Yeah, Rebecca's conniving and or is depicted as being conniving at times. I'm trying to figure out what this question is about. Dina versus Rebecca. Dina doesn't. I don't know. Is is it right. is the reading here that Dina just doesn't say anything about her brothers and her father? You know, and her father plotting against all the men and s killing them all. Versus Rebecca, who actively plots against patriarchy to get what she wants or Miriam's transformation. And I'm not sure what you mean by Miriam's transformation. She, I guess you mean, I guess you mean that she at one point questions Moses's leadership ability. And then mm -hmm. she turns into being the one leading the, you know, leading the celebration after they pass through the, the Red Sea. Um, is that the transformation you mean? Is this intentional cautionary construct? to protect a patriarchy defined world. I always think that just to be very clear, Pleroma not that, <laughs> that the, that the, if there's something that is 
that makes it through that is anti-patriarchy, it's like, wow, look at that. But most of the time it is protecting, I think, because that, because that's, that's their worldview and that's, and they're a small group of people needing, wanting or needing to grow. And so I, I especially in the Hebrew Bible, that's how I do see the narratives protecting patriarchy. If we didn't get into the details, Doc, yeah. message me. You know, you're on Patreon. So just message me and let me know, and I'd be more than happy to get. I know we can only put so many Clarif words in yeah. as well. So give me some clarification, and she'd be happy to, I'm sure, give yeah. you a response to it too. Um, I missed Robert's uh, original super chat. The mm. chat was going fast, and it skipped me down. Aww. Women have qualities, men don't. My woman is my all. Thank That's you, beautiful. Robert. That's beautiful. It's always good to see love for their woman. Mm -hmm. Princess, uh, thank you for the super chat. Love this. Thank you for this. Can you tell us about the historical Lilith or what is said to be true with her? Somewhat new. Sorry if off topic. <laughs> it's really funny because I the first thing that goes up in my head when so thank you, Consuela Banana Hammock. That by the way, that name is fantastic. Um <laughs> I I always I always cringe a little bit. I don't mean any disrespect to you or to Lilith, but because I know that people love Lilith and I think there's something really great about finding a character that people can love and find empowering. And especially given it's coming tangentially to the Hebrew Bible. And so for a lot of people who came from Judaism or Christianity or, you know, context informed by that, it's really empowering to have this Lilith who's, the first who's claimed to be the first woman to Adam and, but she's just too much for him. And, you know, she says, see ya. Um, it isn't the question of whether anything is true, I think is, is a, is a challenging question to answer, right? Mm -hmm. Is any of it true? I mean, is, is the story of Adam and Eve true? No, it's not historically true. Yeah. So there is a story out there about Lilith. So that makes it true, right? That there's a story about her, that there's a, there's a counter narrative that some men and women wanted a counter narrative. And so there, there you have it. Uh, is there, are there layers to this Lilith story? Yes. Right. Uh, does, does Lilith evolve over time? Yes. Is she just one thing, you know, too much, you know, too, you know, she's confident in her own, self and so enough to walk away and then there's this other layer related to babies and death like i don't even know like you, you know, can like she becomes a demon yeah of yeah newborns like sids i also i totally. heard tell me if i'm wrong about this i've not read a lot of literature on lilith but i heard it was her and, and adam had an argument because she wanted to be on top <laughs> and, and i'm not even being like i know it's That's funny awesome. sounding but like for real like she nope. said i'm gonna be on top in sex position mm -hmm. and adam was not having it he wanted to be on top i don't know how true that is but i heard I, something of a story and they argued about it and Lilith was like bye I, it's so like that, that is i i literally never heard that before but i kind of love that that's a story out there i don't know how much to get into on that <laughs> it, one but, but in the chat let me know if you heard that why story. is I that a it. problem <laughs> but that's the thing right like it gets against that patriarchal thing. Like, like if she said, I'm going to want, I want to be on top. And the man says no, or in some way, let's say, I don't know why this would be maybe in their culture. They viewed it as like a thing where it was like, you're supposed to be on the top position and cause you're the man or whatever. No, I, I sure. Don't know. sure, sure, sure. Yeah. yeah. That's the, that's the active place, right. Is the one doing the more, doing more action to the one who's receiving, generally speaking, the person on the bottom is receiving, but that isn't also entirely true. Right, and right, right. I'm sorry, that just opened up a whole can for me because the <laughs> way sex is talked about and the way people are taught, you know, about, about stereotypically, generally speaking, male versus female pleasure, it's much more complex, right? It's... <sighs> I just, rah, there are so many women who have never had an orgasm, but think they have because of the way it's depicted and because of the way pleasure and climax is reached. And, and it's, and, and this concept of saying that, she, saying that the man says, is saying to a woman, no, I don't want you to be in a position that's more pleasurable for you is what that's saying. That's what that's saying to me. That's, I mean, it's just like smoke. I'm just, rah. But it's it's so far reaching. There's this right so far reaching. What people are are not being given access to about their own bodies. 
uh, along these lines. It just kills me. There's a woman who did, I who came to Virginia Tech when I was an undergrad, and I'm Sprinkle. What's her first name? Something Sprinkle. And she had a five minute mm-hmm. orgasm on stage. I'm not exaggerating. Yeah. And, and her point was, she just want people to understand there's more going on here than what you're seeing depicted or what you're, what you've been told. It's not just a thing. It's not, you know, and all of this is related in my mind. All of it is related because right. when you're trying to control a woman's body, that's what, that's what this story about Adam and Lilith wanting to be on top. That's a control of a woman's body. This, all the conversations going on right now about, about how you handle I'm going to do it. Sorry, Derek, how you handle an unplanned pregnancy and who, right. what you can or can't do with that. Like yeah. that's all about controlling a woman's body. All these concepts about virginity and who has, who has access to this body. It's just, it's all of a piece. Okay. Sorry. I forgot to mention. Back to super the, chat. <laughs> I, no, no, this is good. Thank you for that super chat. And I'm gonna get to the next one. Just like, I forgot to mention in your book, you said something and I even called you on the phone about it. Cause I thought this is important to mention. We make like, there are people who are like, right now listening going she just said that <clears throat> and the thing is just so people understand what you said in your book and i can relate to it is we take a subject matter like sex like um the way we view marriage and these privacy situations mm-hmm. and we make them taboo to discuss but every most every i'm not gonna say every almost every that's mm-hmm. that's projecting my experience but my point is is we all want it we're all about it and it's like it's into our culture. It's into our civilization so much, but we don't talk about that. Shh. Mm-hmm. And it's like, no, you, you say up front in your book, you're like, I want people to be open. I want to discuss this. I don't want to hide it underneath the lampstand. And the, you know, like, I want to get it out there and let's speak our minds because there's no reason why we are making it a taboo subject. I, because, I don't see why we're doing it. Right. And because it's taboo, we often are not having, we, we don't have enough information or we don't, you know, whatever, we can just kind of go down the line, right? We, mm-hmm. pe- kids are going to experiment or people are going to experiment and maybe not be as safe as they could be and blah, 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 because they just don't have people having honest, healthy conversations about it. Or okay. you could be someone like me being a little TMI here, but I struggled and beat myself up for years over pornography. I mean, like I legitimately, like I had, it was torture. That's all I could say. It was torture. I'd go down and get prayed over at the youth group. Um, and then I'd be coming back down to get prayed over again a few days later. Like it was this thing going through puberty where I thought maybe I'm not God's, maybe I don't have a spirit. Maybe I'm, you know, and like you for years torture myself. And the thing was all of these youth leaders and members that were in control they were never getting prayed for. It was like they always were on this righteous thing. And I'm thinking, none of them have this issue. None of them talk about this. And I was just being honest. And that's why I am where I am today, because I'm being honest. So I'm a skeptic today because of honesty led me to the conclusions I'm at. Anyway, I just think it's important to let people know, you know, don't be shy. Don't be ashamed. Mm-hmm. Chris Wood, thank you for the super chat. Not sure how off topic this is. What can we know about how ancient views on non cisgender, non cisgender, and sexuality in Canaan? Hmm. The Hebrew Bible seems vague at best and intentionally altered at worst. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, great. I mean, interesting question. I'm trying to mull it over as quickly as I can here. What can we know about ancient views on non cisgender in Canaan? Well, if we can take, <clears throat> excuse me, if we can take what we see in the Hebrew Bible, because I'm not, I don't know a lot of extra biblical parallel texts, just to be clear. Um, I didn't, I have studied some, but not a lot. Uh, so I'd have to reach into stuff I haven't read in a very long time to answer non-biblical, non-biblically speaking. What I love to raise as in response to this question is the, is the reference to Joseph and his father giving him the technicolor dream coat or the, the, the robe, as some people say, whatever. I, Derek, have you and I talked about this before? I can't remember, but I in the Hebrew, that. yeah, in the Hebrew, it's very clear that Jacob gives his favorite son a princess dress and he wears the shit out of that thing. <laughs> And so much so that the rest of the family is uncomfortable with 
Joseph prancing around in a woman's dress. And that's part I did of, not know that. Yes. And that's wow. Part, I mean, when you read this story through that specific question, through that lens of non cisgender, um, or on a love on a certain level, right? That a man cross dressing, but whatever, how whichever piece of that you want to say, you know, was he was he a woman? And this was the closest he could come to reflecting that and, and identifying with that. Uh, whatever. And the thing is, you know, I, I will, I, I talked about this with both, but you know, all my classes this spring and some of them just got, were very quick to say, oh, but this isn't, this isn't positive because the father didn't protect his son. Joseph didn't, or, you know, Jacob didn't protect Joseph from, and prepare him to handle all, I'm like, okay, yeah, this is a 3000 year old story. No, he didn't. <laughs> he actually got a little uncomfortable himself when he started to realize how extensive this was. But I love that. I love that there's a story that acknowledges that, that on some level in a very patriarchal world, Jacob could be really cool with giving his son that, a dress that is only worn by the daughters of kings, and that he was running around wearing it and everybody just like, I love that. It isn't a perfect story, but it's there. The thing is, you will find in the, in the footnotes to that story, the translators, and I haven't looked at more any of the more recent versions, but the translators of the version I'm I have on my desk say we don't actually know what that word is that, in reference to the robe that Joseph is wearing, but the same translation translates that word just fine when it's being worn by a female. So the hmm. the extent to which right the heteronormative because it doesn't fit their narrative. Yeah, in yeah their they mind. literally say we don't know what it means, but they absolutely do. <laughs> Wow. This reminds me of the what you mentioned in your book and has been mentioned on my channel before about the relationship between David and Jonathan. Mm -hmm. Sure, it could have been platonic. Mm -hmm. It could have been a lot more. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. and I think there are good reasons. I've even written Joel Baden. I don't know if you know yes, who yes, he is. Yeah. Okay. Uh, wrote him because I had a friend call, uh, that actually wrote a book called Crucifying the Bible. And uh, she points this out, which how did I not know this? Like I've read mm. this story so many times. I didn't even think about it because I'm coming from a certain perception. Exactly. You're but it's prepared. like they kiss each other on the lips. They have a covenant. He loves her. He loves him more than any woman. Like there's a level and a depth and they were naked making a covenant together. Yes. Things like yes. that. And you're like, what's going on that here? Is you so know? sensual. Yes. Even Joel Baden said that even though a lot of it is ambiguous, he mm -hmm. said like, it, it could easily have absolutely been a love relationship. Like sure that. that. Yes. No. How many times have people, it's, it happens with so many stories where you read through it and he just takes off his clothes and hands it over to David, you know, like giving his power over to him. And did you actually picture that scene? Like, did you picture two men standing together and one disrobes in front of the other? Come on. <laughs> Yeah, because if you go back to Noah's son seeing his nakedness, and it's yeah. a bad thing, right? You right. got to wonder who the author, or the redactor is here that's saying this. Right. And then you see Jonathan's nudeness and naked in front of David, and it's like, yes. You got to wonder, like, totally. are these the same authors here? Totally. And who's right. the right. one behind this text? Because yeah, that's interesting. Interesting. It is. It is. Thank you, Chris. Kate Burke says, keep up the great Aww. conversations. I hey, like Kate. the pedestal thing. <laughs> <laughs> I can't dance on a pedestal. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Thank you, Kate. Kate. Clark Morledge is the seven authentic letters. Paul egalitarian and Deutero Paul misogynist. What about first Corinthians 11, two through 16? Yeah. This is one of the reasons why I would prefer people to get the audio versus the paperback on my book, because I, I try to address that in the, in the section on Paul and I've changed my mind on what I have in the book because mm. of Antoinette Clark Wire's book. Yes. The, the, um, Corinthian prophet, prof sorry, I'm butchering the title, the women, Corinthian prophets, whatever Corinthian women, prophets, whatever it is. Um, so my quick take on that is I think that the uh, authentic letters of Paul is, mostly egalitarian but then he slips back in he his uh more deeply rooted misogynist reaction to women trying getting all uppity right taking him at his word 
uh, about having a voice and wanting to do, you know, like this is what the spirit told us. And so we're going to proclaim it. And he gets, he's irritated by that and he puts him down. So yes, what you're saying, what you're raising about first Corinthians 11, two to 16 in my book, I do this really, really bizarre because it was the best thing I'd seen by David Scott Odell. Um, really bizarre, like way to make it work. Cause I want, I just, that was what made work for me at the time that I wrote the book. And now I don't agree with that. I think that he is trotting out these different angles on the issue and half, you know, it's misogynistic. Like there's, it's relate it. He, re, he reverts back to a particular reading of men being dominant over women in Genesis, which isn't necessarily what's being said there. So, so he changes his mind kind of sort of, or he does, time. he okay. does. And, and I actually did too, along with it in that funny way. And so that's, there's the first Corinthians 11. And then there's also that segment in first Corinthians 14 verses 33 B to 36, which I'm, I'm assuming Clark is familiar with that because you're asking this specific reference. And I would highly, highly, highly recommend a, um, Antoinette Clark Wire's book. Um, I have it right here. The Corinthian women prophets. Okay. Okay. Reconstruction it, through Paul's red, uh, Paul's rhetoric. rhetoric. Yeah. If yeah. you're into going deep and like really getting into text and like what happened here and how, why is it? And people say this was inserted later and blah, blah, blah. If you're into that kind of stuff, it is fantastic. It ought to be like, you know, game changing for everybody, but not everybody reads it because it's dense and she put a lot into it. So Wow. I hope that answers your question, Clark. I think he tried. I think he started out and meant well or tried well and then just, no, People but then, minds, yeah, yeah, but the Deutero Paul is absolutely reverting back to dominance over and submissive, you know, like men over women. So that's a fairly clear consistency within the Deutero. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Clark. Yeah, that was great. Jess Lee says men want to believe women come with a purity seal. It isn't true. In the past, women were sometimes given a vial of blood in case they didn't bleed. That's or awesome. Rag. I've heard even a rag. I've heard like a rag that had blood on it. Oh so gosh, they could say, oh, that. look, see? Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Because we know this isn't going to go well. So let's do it. But it also brings up, you know, the um, the female genital mutilation, which does take place still on this planet. You know, this idea of sometimes just literally sewing her up so that a man can cut her open on their wedding night. I mean, it, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. Removal of a woman's clitoris. So she can't have I've any heard sexual. Of that. I didn't know As, about there's just like, different forms of, yep. Sometimes they remove the labia entirely. Sometimes they just sew her up and it becomes a problem health wise, like all kinds of stuff. Sorry. So I, sorry, oh, yeah, I can't I help it. I've never heard of that. I have wow. to bring it up. So, but yes, <sighs> I know. It what just the is heck? Awful. But thank you, Jess, because that, I, I love that. that yeah. When you're in the system, you find your way around it, right? <laughs> That's true. I think there's a story Christine Hayes mentioned in uh, one of her lectures. I always love listening to her lectures. Hmm. She's talking about a rabbi. I've mentioned this before on my channel. So if you're like a faithful here, you've probably heard me say this before, but they had like this, uh, one of the leaders of the community rabbis where the newlywed or whatever would bring his woman to the rabbi and go, I think she's been unfaithful. <laughs> and uh, I don't think that she, you know, has her, virginity and the rabbi would tell her to sit on this barrel of wine and then he would say if i can smell the wine through her breath then she's been unfaithful there's that seal idea that idea yes but if i can't smell it then she's a virgin and even if she doesn't bleed trust me she's a virgin and more often than not christine hayes said this she said more often than not by the time the rabbis are writing this stuff they're wise, a lot of these men, and they realize this, this is a problem. So mm -hmm. they would just, maybe the father would pay the rabbi off. There's no telling, but they would say, oh, I don't smell it. She's a virgin. And then yep. she'd be off. Oh, Here's yes, our off little with you. test. Yeah. And it's crazy. I thought that was funny. She said, I don't know. I mean, it's not funny, but I thought it was right, kind of right. humorous to think like, you're going to sit on a barrel of wine. And if I can smell it through your breath. Yeah it's somehow vapors are coming through your body. Like yeah, it's, it's right. Just wild. Right. 
Mm. But yes, that back to that idea of the seal or or what a lot of people are taught, which is what you'd referenced earlier, Derek, right? That or at least in, in some part that this idea that the hymen is fully intact and has to be right. penetrated, right? A lot of people believe that and are taught that, right? This this thing that gets to be opened up, <laughs> popped. Right. Not, not. Mm -mm. All thank you, about, Jess. Yes, thank you. Jennifer Silves, it's not Hi. fair to blame Deanna for her brothers killing the city. Imagine how she felt. No way she had a chance to warn them. Her brothers probably lied to her, too. Oh, yeah. Oh, I didn't mean to blame her. I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to. I, I <laughs> This is all about men and power and rawr, territory. And, and Weren't I, you trying to say that the man that loved her, wanted to marry her, and maybe the brothers didn't like this yeah. or something yeah or... i and i didn't we didn't fully i guess d fully discuss discuss it um i was trying to highlight that i just think it's so interesting that it's really about a battle between the brothers and the men it isn't really even about dina and it's it's just it's it's uh, ironic isn't really the word but it's the one story that people associate with rape that probably isn't actually rape in the bible but Bathsheba is raped. Uh, the woman in Judges 19 is raped. Like all these other women are absolutely the woman in Hosea is raped. You know, like it's just really weird to me it, or something like it. I, wanna I forgot apart. about that woman in Judges that you brought up that like mm -hmm. horrified me for a moment to think about. Cause like I remember reading it and then it was like, you, you kind of just forget about it. It's, it's intense. You it's intense because Jethro's daughter comes on a lot because, you know, we're skeptic atheist and, you know, you're like trying to say, look, here's this man that like, right. makes a vow with God. God yeah. doesn't tell him, hey, dude, I'm not taking your daughter as a sacrifice. Right. And you even said a little comment in passing about that Jethro's daughter sacrifice thing. You said and you asked a question, but it was like a s profound statement. You said, would he have done it if it was a male? If it was a son, would he have done it? And you kind of wonder, like, probably not. I don't know, you know, like, but it makes you think. Um, can you tell us about that rape while we have Jennifer's super chat up about sure. what happens in Judges? In Judges, yeah. I had it marked. Let's see if I, what happens in Judges 19. You, you don't have to read it if you don't I'm not going, I realize as soon as I said that, that, it's, that it takes too much time. Um, Judges 19 is a story about a Levite. So he should be holy. Right. That's that's part of the point that people stop. Don't stop to talk about. He should be a member of the, you know, the people that know how to worship God well. And he takes a woman as a concubine. So, like, she's there for sex. <laughs> that's her right. purpose in his life. And she leaves him. And so the qu it's, there's too much about this story. I, I'm sorry, I'm going to get into the weeds and I shouldn't. Uh, she leaves him. And the lots of debate about why is it that she was cheating on him or was he not treating her well? It doesn't matter because what she goes home, he comes and follows her, he takes her back. And as they're returning home, they this scene in Judges 19 um, happens. It is a parallel to what happens in Genesis 19 when there are visitors in the city of Sodom and how are they treated by Lot and how are they treated by the other people of Sodom. So this is a parallel story with a different purpose, but it's it, it's being used to rally the troops to take down one of the tribes of Israel because they aren't being hospitable enough. But in the story, they're brought in, just like Lot brings in these travelers, they are traveling through and someone in the town brings them in. Same scenario, same setup, and the men of the town come and s surround the house, just like they did in Genesis 19. But in But in Judges 19, instead of Angels coming in to save the day and preventing the two daughters back in back in Lot's day, preventing the two daughters from being thrown to the mob. This this Levite hands over his concubine to the crowd of men who want to rape somebody, and they do all night. And in the morning. She has crawled back toward the house and is passed out or died, doesn't say for sure in the story, with her hand on the threshold, as in she's trying to get back to safety. And in the morning, the Levite walks right past her and says, get up, it's time to go. <clears throat> and she doesn't move, so he puts her on the donkey, he takes her home, and it is not clear in the narrative which piece of this he takes as an offense. Is it that somebody has 
been unhospitable to his property? Is it that it's not clear, but it is a, in the narrative of the patriarchal worldview, this this town of Benjaminites who should be treating Israelite well, Israelites well are not. And so he takes her home and cuts up her body into 12 pieces. Again, it's not clear in the narrative if she's already died or if this is, you know, it, it, it doesn't matter. And it does. And he sends her body parts to the tr other tribes saying, this is what happens when we don't have a king. This kind of ca chaos and awful stuff takes over. And it's really not clear where the offense is, but he has just chopped up this woman to make a point or as a rallying cry. Mm. Yeah. And it's just, I want to vomit right now. You know, it's just, it's just so unsettling to see to see that language and anyway. Yeah, I forgot about that one until I read your book and I was mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. well, I'm not done with your book because we're gonna have to do more than just this one. But thank you, Jennifer, for the super chat. Yes, thank you, Jennifer. Tim, thank you, Tim Pulver. Mm -hmm. Former, Former fundy here. I used to believe that at one time in history, the Old Testament was God's holy thoughts until saw some sections, minimal human standards. Mm -hmm. Well, you're in good company, Tim, right? Mm -hmm. you're seeing some things and deciding to use your current understanding of morals and ethics, right? And saying it doesn't work for you. Nope. Tim, thanks yep. for uh, the support and the, the comment. Yeah. Chiming in. Gen oh. Jennifer's back says, how have you never heard <laughs> Lilith wanted to be on top before? I love it. That's I don't know oldest. how I've never, I think I just stay away from Lilith. because. <laughs> Yeah, I, I heard it and I was like, okay. And at the time, I don't know what, uh, maybe I thought at the time, you know what? Good for Adam. You know, there's <laughs> right, no telling. Right, I, there's no sure, telling. That I would mean, make I, sense. You know, good for Adam. She seemed disrespectful anyways. Right. You know, like, like, like she's telling him what to do? No. <laughs> uh, okay, Jennifer, I will, I will try to go read this, look for that story. <laughs> Jennifer, thank you for that uh, comment and having uh, having a laugh there. Topic discussed. Gary, my friend Gary, Aww. good YouTube channel, says, D, I'm so jealous you get to talk to her. I would, and then it cut off. Mm. That's sweet. Gary, I missed the rest of your chat. I was looking for it just now. Love you, brother. Thank you for coming in and showing some love. Jennifer says, God writes pornography what he says to Israel. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's what we just went through in Hosea. Porn pornography. And also, yeah, not even that. Like, awful, right? And sometimes well, if it's not porn, it's like, it's like over the top kind of threats about like, yeah, exactly. you will eat the flesh of you. I will make you eat your children. And like, Stew's like, anger. Mm -hmm. whoa, like, like you will become dung. I will make you into a pot. And in the term, the vernacular is actually being used in the Hebrew. So he's like, you will be shit. Mm -hmm. literally not just mm -hmm. you're gonna be a pile mm -hmm. of dookie you're gonna be <laughs> poo -poo. no he's mad like what do you say when you're mad you know what i mean yes exactly yeah mm. thank you yeah Jennifer. i just want to make sure i didn't miss anybody here oh we do mm. got a couple more i'm sorry um did you want to comment about that i will when you, you i cut you off i'm sorry no, it's totally fine. I no, thank you. But I, I, it it just when you start talking about porn and the Bible, I I go to Song of Songs. You know, it's soft porn, but it is. I mean, there's some some stuff being described there. My favorite. I actually have a one of the clips on my on my channel is um, from a class that I recorded, and I asked the students, you know, if I could share it more widely because it's it's the it's that really it's that song um that i used to sing you know he brought me to the banqueting table and his banner over me is love you know well in context there's it's like a clear reference to like oral sex <laughs> like she's giving him a blowjob and i'm singing this song about jesus loving me and i'm thinking all kinds of great sweet lovely things i'm not thinking sex i'm thinking no 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 i get it i get and, it and yet it's it's one of the most explicit references to sex in the whole book it's just funny yeah i thought it was interesting i heard that the song of solomon that this is the one we're talking about right the, the sexual yeah. implicitly it's clearly a woman and of course uh Jews would interpret this as Israel. And of course, Christians mm -hmm. interpret this as 
the bride of Christ, Christ or whatever. Church, yeah. Yes. But I heard that because this was one of those books that was so controversial, some rabbis made it the most holy book in the Bible. Hmm. I heard that this is something that they did is they made okay. it the most holy book. It's almost like um, when you, when you contest a text that they say is holy or sacred, they go, they overcompensate, make it so holy. It's holier than everything. Kind of like, um, what is the, uh, the, the book? Uh, I'm trying to think of the Jewish book that it doesn't mention the name of God in it. Um, Esther. Esther. Yeah. And there's some people who are like, Oh, some would argue, well, God's name doesn't oh, show up. This isn't funny. a book. Others go, are you kidding me? God breathes through the material of the text. So, <laughs> I just, I heard that and I was like, that's interesting. I've never, never thought about why they did that. But if you want to keep your kink in your holy text, you better make yeah. that the holiest kink you've ever heard of. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I, I'm trying to get back to Jennifer's comment because I think the, what's interesting to me is when I look at Ezekiel chapter 16, it starts out, it sounds very either pervish or porn ish before he starts like lashing out and calling them whores. So I think that there's, there are times when God talks to Israel in a way that sounds like it's more, you know, sounds before it starts getting abusive. I just don't personally want abuse to be a part of, I guess abuse is part of por some porn anyway. Meh. Yeah. But the, this doesn't seem like the recipient is interested. Um, Jennifer Silf says, again, me nodding on the Dina response. Mm, cool. Cool. Thanks. Okay. Good. I'm just making sure that we covered everybody because it tends to happen. Uh, Jennifer says, love Jennifer Bird. Happy Aww. to have made the stream. And I think we caught up. Yes, I think we're caught up. I don't like to leave anybody hanging. So thank you so much for all those super chats. Um, we talked about well, we didn't really dive into Jephthah's daughter. Maybe you want Correct. to actually dive into that. We went into the dark one in Judges. Um, we talked about Hosea. Hosea. And, and we the the other one, we can talk about Jephthah if, you, if you'd like. I think that, you know, you already touched on the, I think in a sense, what most people think of, which is why would Jephthah make a promise to God that if, if he's successful, he will sacrifice whoever first, you know, whoever greets him out of his house. Is he expecting it to be the dog that he loves or the child that he loves? Cause that's, he's a widow where he doesn't have a spouse and he has one child. Like who does he think it's going to be? And a lot of people, you know, like do want to talk about that. And I think that's important that he would perhaps was a little bit easier for him to make that promise um, since the child was a daughter and he might have thought twice if it had been a son who knows but also for me what the story is also about the fact that she just says okay you know when he says yeah i made this promise <laughs> i made this promise so i gotta kill you you know and she's like okay uh let me go mourn first you know and so she goes out and for two weeks roams the hillside with some of her friends and what they mourn is that she will die without having sex. She will die not having known a man so that what that is communicating is one of the roles or purposes of women is to be a thing for men to mm -hmm. use. And it's subtle or not. I don't know, but I, you know, I try to ask my students like, what is it that the women are mourning and they make a they make a reference in the story to the fact that this becomes a regular a yearly not festival but acknowledgement and what are they mourning are they mourning that she didn't have children are they mourning that she died she died a virgin that is a really fascinating thing to uphold and to perpetuate what are you communicating to people that that's it's not that she was sacrificed, that her father killed her. It's that she died without having had sex yet on so many levels. That is a, that sends such fascinating weird. messages. Right. Yeah. yeah she, I'm wondering if it's just that she wasn't a virgin, but that she didn't get to reproduce and carry sure. a child or something and that's like that. A, they're a baby making machine. A so. Right. A shorthand for not getting to be, a, you know, producing a child as she didn't even have sex. Yeah. Maybe. There's a Greek equivalent here in the Trojan War, I believe. I mentioned this in the last episode, and I I really should refresh and memorize who the names are. 
but it was mentioned in um, Can Canada Moss or Candida Moss. People, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the name is Canada, spelled like, Moss, yeah. Canada. Um, mm -hmm. In her book, Myth, The Myth of Persecution, there's a section where she talks about stories before Jesus about martyrdom and like people who were willing to sacrifice, self-sacrifice, like what we see with Socrates, like what we see with other people. Give me, give me that poison, you know, and they go mm -hmm. to their deaths in an honorable way. One of the kings calls to his his daughter, his wife and his daughter, um, to come that he had found a, a husband, which already raises the, the dating on some of this material, right? Like he mm -hmm. found her a husband to mm -hmm. get her married to. Mm -hmm. She comes and she's in joy thinking, okay, I'm finally going to be a woman and I'm going to have my own family, this kind of thing. When he gets there, when she gets there with her mother, um, the news breaks out. Like she finds out, actually, I'm sacrificing you to the gods. So he lied to her to get her to come to Mary and I'm sacrificing you to the gods so that we will win the war. Mm -hmm. And the whole, everybody mourned and cried and whatnot. And then she's known for saying, in the text, she's known for saying, don't weep for me. Don't cry. I'm going to, I'm doing this for our nation to win, but also let this be my marriage. Let this sacrifice be my marriage, mm -hmm. which is just weird. Anyway, it was just another equivalent in the Greek world that I thought about in this sense. And it's mm -hmm. like, here is this thing we don't really think about. He's already going to be giving her to a man so that he can take her, right? It's just a different world. So it is a different world. It's an interesting way to justify it, perhaps, right? To make some sort of valiant, uh, yeah, offering or make it she's okay with it. Right. Very, right. All kinds of interesting pieces there. Yeah. Right. The, and I think, and she, I, I have not read that book by Candida, but I, I would like to, but I imagine she also ends up talking about Perpetua and Felicity. Does, did yeah. she talk about them? Yeah. yeah. And their martyrdom and how they, a similar thing, right? They give up their femaleness in order to, uh, anyway, and choose to die um, specifically. Mm. Stop. Yeah. Stop being a mother. Stop nursing a child specifically. Just so I, everybody knows we're wrapping things up here oh, soon. Yeah. If that's, well, Good. I'm not yep. ending yet, but I just wanted to let everybody know, like, if you have a question, get it out now. Um, Robert says, what fool doesn't like a woman? <laughs> <laughs> Robert, your trip. Right. I like that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Someone who hasn't, who hasn't experienced it, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer says, Jephthah's daughter, ouch. What's the Hebrew? I thought it was first living thing on returning home. How is this not a type of Iphigenia? Uh, yeah, can't even pronounce it. Uh, what's the Hebrew? You mean, oh, you mean in terms of what he says? I, I'd have to go look it up. And uh, that would take me a few minutes to go find that real quick, uh, to find that. Um, we don't have a few minutes. Yeah, I know you don't. That's why I was like, oh, I'm sorry. I don't know what it says. But it is, it's basically, yeah, I'll just, I'll offer up the first thing that greets me from my house is, is what he's saying. So mm. it seems like either you just weren't thinking that one through, buddy, or what? What is that? You know, careless. He's not not the sharpest tool in the shed. Not quite sure what that's trying to say about him. Right. Yeah. I don't either. Yeah. yeah. And Jennifer comes back. The husband was Achilles. It wasn't joy about being married. It was Achilles. Also Achilles found out and offered to marry her. Mm. I don't know mm. if the, I'd have to reread um, Canada Moss's book. And I think I packed it with the rest of my stuff. I probably did because all my boxes are already in the West Coast where I'm headed here ah, soon. Wow. Uh, that's exciting. Then, I don't know. I don't have a date, but it's happening. Mm -hmm. um, but mm -hmm. in that book, she definitely I almost want to pull it up, but we don't have time. Same reason you could pull up and then find <laughs> out. But it was just this girl went to her death, did not get married. It was a lie. Her dad tricked her into coming out as if she was going to get married and then, then ended up uh, sacrificing her. Mm hmm. Um, yeah, sorry. I, I was going to move on to a different thing, but I, because I wasn't sure there was another question and I wanted to get this one, oh, last one more. Week. And then yeah, oh, great. Don't forget where you're at. Paulo's Christian apologetics says, I wanted to say Ephesians was pseudepigrapha in Bible study, but I let my Christian friends gaslight Ephesians 523 instead when the chapter came laughing my, you know, what off. Mm -hmm. uh, pseudepigrapha. Yeah. You wanted to say that, uh, but you let them gaslight. <laughs> 
Um, that's funny. I, I appreciate that. I guess that you wanted to wait. I'm like 23 is the part that says, sorry, I need to make sure I'm clear on that one. Oh yeah. 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 For the husband is the head of the wife, just as Christ is head of the church, the body of which he is the savior. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. Well, sorry. Cause then the, the chapter on Ephesians five in my book is I have to talk about this whole thing and the whole, and the way that this section about Christ in the church becomes is where we, is where the church itself gets the sacramental language to say that marriage is a sacrament uh, that comes up later. And thanks to Augustine and all kinds of things. Um, yeah. You're, you were kind. So, oh, Jennifer. Jennifer. I'm like, she knows what disgusting. she's talking about. <laughs> I'm not arguing with you at all. Okay. I'm not arguing. Thank you so much for yeah. correcting me and just making it clear. I didn't need to reread it because it, it, that story, I was listening to music, like instrumental music while I was reading. It helps me kind of feel, and it put me into a mode where I felt like I felt bad, like for the, the girl. And I was like, you know, trying to really kind of imagine self-sacrifice. And in fact, I was a bit emotional, even in that interview to like, let people know mm -hmm. I do not want, I'm not being mocking. I'm not trying to play games or, pretend that that self-sacrifice isn't the highest achievement people can make for other people to try and like selflessly help mm -hmm. to do something and, and whatnot. But, uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but I also am very questioning of some of the things that people are attributing as self-sacrifice when they say I'm being martyred or I'm a <laughs> martyr or I'm being persecuted. And it's like, <laughs> are you though? You're knocking on their door. Like you're knocking on their door and you're being persecuted. Can you stop knocking on their door? It might help if you're not breaking laws, <laughs> running out, trying to break laws to, you know, do things. I'm just speaking in terms of like certain things that were activities that were going on at the time may have been illegal, which caused Christians at times to be targeted and going to court and whatnot. Um, I'm not saying it was right or wrong. I'm just saying like, it's not, you're completely innocent at all times too. And then last one, Abel, uh, can Adam and Eve be two couples for each of the human races? And can the Messiah be a woman, a woman who ruled over males and start the wars? Can Adam and Eve be two couples for each of the human races? I'm, I wish I understood better what that question is saying, because I'm not sure. Do you mean they're two different, like Genesis 1, God creates male and female simultaneously, and that's a one version and Genesis two is a second version. I'm not quite sure what to make of that first. Can the Messiah be a woman? Uh, that's a really interesting question because I, um, no and yes, or I don't know. And, and all kinds of debate about, well, he had to be a male because no one would pay attention to him if he was a female. And if God came as female and wh what are we saying about, you know, are you, are you asking Christologically speaking, are you saying uh, in terms of an actual human who comes and tries to bring about the promises to Abraham, which, you know, which, which part of this can a Messiah be like, which version of Messiah are you thinking of? Um, there's, there are also Catholic theologians, Rosemary Radford Ruther, who just recently died, actually, uh, just a powerhouse of a woman, wrote, did quite a bit on this topic about does a male, can a male savior save women, right? If, if God, if Christ had to be male and all those pieces, and if the, the Catholic church in particular wants to associate the maleness of Christ with the maleness of priests and all that stuff, is it possible for... The, I think are, Abel says... Each, oh, race each race, white, black, brown, etc. I think that that's a misunderstanding of like race and things like that too. That's we. It's an outdated concept of understanding race as well. I think. Wouldn't you agree? Yes. Because now we're dealing with is... like pigmentation, and there's a whole lot of problems in that Abel. But I, I, I Abel has chatted many times. In yeah, the past, right. So I, I remember. They're, there's they're not like. Being, I think there's a good intention here. I right. think I'm, I'm missing. Um, and I'm sorry about that, Abel. Cause I, I think you probably have an interesting question you're trying to raise, but I just, missing and Abel it. helps a lot with super chats, Abel email me. And I would be more than happy to ask Jennifer or any academic that I have uh, in as friends that I can see about getting some of your questions answered and see what they have to say. Um, thank you so much for the super chat though. And then a final lesson from, Oh, your whoa, Jennifer. <laughs> I have to, because you really, you've been helping out a lot. I read mm -hmm. Iphigenia in second year Greek. It liked me. 
she sacrificed herself. This is right. The winds, that's right, for their ships to take off. Mm -hmm. I, I butchered the story just trying to even read. She sacrificed herself so her dad, Agamemnon, Agnamin, could sell ships to Troy. When he yeah. returned from Troy, his wife, Clyde I can't Nestra. even, I'm not even going to try. Mm -hmm. Helen's sister killed him, but she was dragged. Hmm. She was dragged. I'm just making sure I didn't miss this. Yeah, follow if Iphigenia was sacrificed so they could sail off to war, right? Dragged, not not. Liked. Oh, dragged, not killed. Okay, not liked, killed. Hmm. I'm I'm lost in yeah, which part I, we're connecting with here. I do remember that they were worried about the winds. That's yeah. true. Like yeah. they're and not able to leave the mm -hmm. port or something, mm -hmm. and so her mm -hmm. sacrifice is supposed to somehow make the gods happy and so that the winds will go in the correct direction and right yes give them fair sailing yeah clear sailing to their destination jennifer please uh forgive me on my ignorance i am definitely trying to learn this so thank you also for the support dr bird did you forget mm -hmm. i hope you didn't forget where you were on what you i were didn't forget i don't know if, if we have time for it i you please. know i one of the things i wanted to say is that we spent most of our time in the hebrew bible and as we didn't right, we didn't really talk about how women are valued in the newer Testament. And, and again, you would note it up front. These are, these are things we want to make sure people just, they've been overlooked, right? So there's a, there are many things we didn't touch on that we could have. So that's, that is important right. again to re note, but um, my, my, well, you know, what got me most, Hmm. Uh, there's a passage in first Peter that I focus on in my dissertation, the first Peter three, one to six. And it, it to me, it is a similar pair. It's a parallel to the Hosea piece in that, in that passage, the, the author of the letter of first Peter is telling the women to be silent and submissive. He's telling them not to adorn themselves outwardly. Again, this is a kind of a thing that often happens in abusive relationships, um, right? So that there's a, there's a stripping down of the woman's personality. There's a, right, she's literally being told to be silent um, and, to, and to be subject to her man. And the, the final verse or two in 1 Peter, this passage being addressed to women in 1 Peter, um, says that the women in, in this and being the sorry i'm getting tired and i'm and i'm forgetting the specific language i was trying to i okay. had it pulled up um sorry so it's saying the uh the, the women of old you know were obedient to their masters right and so you are daughters of sarah if you are if you do what is right and are not frightened by terrifying things most english translations tone down that terror part <laughs> because we don't want to scare people <laughs> But in the but but in First Peter, it's saying right, you are being you're experiencing terrifying things, and so you're like Sarah when you endure it. And when was Sarah terrified? You know, when she was handed over to the Pharaoh, right, and mm -hmm. she had to spend a night or nights or whatever with him. And so there's this a, a really really interesting way of looking at that passage in First Peter has you know is telling women to endure sexual abuse, endure violence at the hand of your, your spouse. There's a lot of context behind it that says that's what's happening here is that women are doing this thing in this new Jesus thing and their spouse, their men aren't on board. And so there's, there's tension in the household. And so the men are being violent and abusive. I mean, it's just all this stuff comes together. Why is the one time that Sarah is held up as someone to emulate the one time in the entire Bible, is here in First Peter when she's endured something terrifying. You are her daughters if you also endure terrifying things. And it is a passage that has led many a pastor who meant well, I really do believe that, to encourage, to counsel women to stay in abusive relationships. Because look, it says you can win them over with your with your word, with your behavior. Um, which there are people who believe that because it says in God's word, you can win people, you can win over an abuser. They believe that that's true, even though we know right. that's not true. So anyway, I, I needed, I wanted to kind of wrap that up for myself because it's not just the Hebrew Bible where we see women with a mixed message and more heavy on the, you are, your value comes in being a, 
a vessel or being used by men for sex or whatever, and we don't really care about you. It's also happening in the newer Testament. And that's important to me to at least have at least a little moment on that. So, yeah, no, no, no. I, I appreciate it. And I'm glad you actually got it out. I want to mention the head covering thing for a moment. Hmm. Um, to hide yourself. And Paul mm -hmm. sounds like a superstitious guy. Uh, I, I bring this up because he's saying like these, these demons, these, these, what, when you read Genesis, you read these sons of God mm. saw daughters of men that they were beautiful and mm -hmm. took them mm -hmm. again. Mm -hmm. Here we are with a taking language, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, took them and then produced these Nephilim and these demon giants, whatever you want to call them. Enoch likes to paint a very vivid picture about these creatures, mm -hmm. but, but Paul's like saying like, Hey, 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 the angels are going to, you know, you, you <laughs> the sh cover what God <laughs> gave you. Okay. What's your, what's your mama gave you. That's right. You That's right. Cover it. You yeah. may not even give it to the mama. Like at least we say cover what your mama gave you. Right. But mm -hmm. he's probably saying cover what God gave you so that the angels don't come down and try to have sex with you. and yes. rape you. Yes. They won't be distracted in worship or whatever. Yeah. Won't come down and try to have sex. Yes. Pretty wild. I mean, you, you think about like all the commercials where women, where the, where it's a woman and she's flinging her hair as the part of the sexual, the sensual, whatever allure, right? Like mm -hmm. it's nothing new, like <laughs> yeah. cover your hair. Cause that's, that's your glory. Yeah. The Presbyterian church I got excommunicated from, there were women in the congregation that wore veils in, in wow. when they did service. Wow. Yeah. So I, I got to experience. Yeah, it was it was a reformed. They were kind of an offshoot of Puritans in a way. Mm -hmm. They didn't go so far, but they that we we read the Puritans. We were reading all of these people to learn about holiness and how yes. to live. And it's like. They went so far. I mean, it, it was pretty bad. I had elders come to my front door when I was still a member of this church on a on a Sunday when I didn't go to church. Elders would show up and uh, multiple, by the way, they come in groups and they would come to <laughs> tell me you you did not appear on the Sabbath. They considered <sighs> Sunday Sabbath and they were like, you're not keeping God's day holy and you didn't attend what's going on. And they want to like control you. Yes. And they even offered, in fact, might be worth it just to have this little comment here. In fact, um, they offered to tell my wife to stop working. They actually tried to, t you're going to need to hear this for yourself. I'm calling her right now. It's worth <laughs> it. It's worth it. Hey, honey, I got you on speakerphone. Yeah, we're on, what? We're, we're live here on Myth Vision. But I just wanted your words because I talk all the time and the elders at the church and at the Presbyterian church we were excommunicated from. You remember when they told you to stop working? What did they tell you? Um, hold on, honey. Hold on. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yes. <laughs> you better believe it. <laughs> right. I'm sorry. All right. You're live. To the contractor. Okay. Well, hmm. I'm busy, honey. So can you tell everybody real quick just uh, what what the elders at the church were trying to offer you and tell you to stop working? They said if I quit my job, then they would pay our necessities, like our, you know. Why? Why or, did they do that? Yeah, I could tell you why, but why? Because they wanted me to stay home and homeschool our kids and be a stay-at-home mother like all the other moms. Yep. Seriously? So they want, oh, you can't hear uh, Dr. Bird. Let me put. Let me oh, yeah. Sorry about the that. audio so you can hear her responding real quick here. Okay. So go ahead, Dr. Bird. I was it seriously? They they were they were just trying to control your life like that? <laughs> what? Oh yeah. And I worked the funny part is I worked for um one of the elders. Oh my gosh. Was he was a dentist. At I'm sure he didn't know that the pastor was, you know, making saying this, him, but I did work for him. Oh my gosh. Oh, it's just gross. Like, you know, like control and oh, I'm so sorry. I was in the system and we when me and her were fighting, we want and I was trying to get her to submit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, I mean, right. I really was. I was I part believe of that. this. Right. Because that's what you thought you needed came, to do. Yeah, and the pastor came over and was like kind of like getting on to her and like was rebuking as well to try and get her to submit. And uh I was all a part of it. So 
I mean, I'm glad we got to where we are now, of course. Thank you. But are you talking about when y'all came to the house? Yeah, that was a different time. But I'm saying, like, <laughs> they would offer, they would offer to try and like pay you and pay our bills so that you would stop having to go to work and be a stay at home mother and be a, a, a submissive, obedient wife in a household, all of that kind of right. stuff. Right. So Trust this me, is you real. do not want me homeschooling my children. <laughs> <laughs> One on might be learn strangled nothing. to death. Ah, you're not listening. <laughs> you know. Well, not only that, but they ain't gonna learn anything. If I'm you know, homeschooled, she has no patience so, to do all that. Yeah. Mm. Well, I love right. you, honey. Thank you for right. thanks for coming for, on, Ryan. Yeah. And no worries. I can't hear that good because the it, at least you can hear goes. something though. But all right, I love yeah. you. All right, love you. Bye. Bye. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's real. So what Dr. Bird is saying for those who go, that's not true. My my local Baptist church doesn't do that. Well, it's as real as real. I mean, it's they were a cult cult like it's legit. And I got excommunication legal documents, court documents. (laughs) (laughs) You were served papers. I was served in the mail, legit court documents. And they were like, you are no longer a member at all. I'm and like, then thank you. <laughs> I was glad. Yeah. I was like, whoo, relief because I don't have to worry wow. about that anymore. Yeah. The control. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh my mm-hmm. gosh. But look at where you've gone from there. Right. The way you they found your way. I'm as Satan oh, they are, and, yeah. and possessed by the they, devil mm-hmm. as possible. And mm-hmm. they're, they were, that's how they work. Going straight the to earth, hell. Yeah, they think the earth is 7,000 years old. Mm-hmm. Like, they are really mm-hmm. hardcore conservative. So, mm-hmm. let's put it mm-hmm. that way. Jennifer Sills was correcting. Uh, Clytemnestra was blamed. I love the fact that Jennifer's coming back. <laughs> blamed equals dragged. Oh. I need to interview uh, Jennifer on cla- I like some, know. some old uh, Greek myths. Please you get what please you get email. and you don't throw a fit when you get what. <laughs> right? That's my daughter. You get what you get. Don't throw a fit when you get what Agamemnon got. Mm. Hmm. I definitely need to. Oh, You're hold on. I'm, Jennifer's throwing more love. What she the is heck? really. Seriously showing mm-hmm. love. Mm-hmm. Uh, I got to show you love back. Money for your wife. Well, <gasps> love that. She, absolutely. Mrs. Myth Vision, man. Manny said, yes. <laughs> Mrs. Mrs. Myth Vision will get uh-huh. the money. Trust me. Uh-huh. She gets all of it. So don't let her <laughs> Trust me, she has my wallet yeah, right budget. now yeah. in her purse. Anytime we need anything, she, <laughs> she's, I depend on her like with everything. So Jennifer says homeschooling is best, but another 20 for 20 for your wife. <laughs> <laughs> she's going to love you. I'm going to say, hey, you're going to need to watch the latter part of this interview. Mm-hmm. You are mm-hmm. the famous star, honey. Mm-hmm. So. Thank you so much, uh, Doctor Bird. I guess yeah. let, look this new setting. I tried it out earlier. We're gonna yeah. kind of feel our way out, right? So, so here we are. We got the. P- I'm gonna stop that. Actually, let me do this. Right. Stop it and do it from the beginning. Here we go. All right. Thank you for those who haven't already. Go get the book. Oh, I promise it's good. Tell us about the book as we're. It's the the best of the best in terms of the moments from classrooms where I got to do intros to both of the Christ, primary Christian testaments, and it's the best conversations that come up, the ones that are most important to people. And I'm trying to take those classroom moments and conversations that we had and mm-hmm. present it for people who aren't able to be in that classroom but want the same kind of knowledge, want to have those thoughtful engagements. Um, here, here's some things to think about. This is an angle on all these issues um, that I think is good to sit with. Don't try to sweep it under the rug. Let's be honest about what's in there. And the permission granted is bring your questions. You are per- you are permitted to ask your questions. You know, you're permitted to not agree with something that you find in the Bible and to say that yeah, that doesn't work for me. You're that what you need to do with this text, whatever it is, that permission is granted. Mm. And then your website, of course, everybody, please go check out her website. You can actually contact her too. If you obviously no trolls, please, but 
please uh, make a contact, especially if you love what you hear. And uh, I want to have her back on Myth Vision a lot more often. She also has the Vimeo. So if you're at home and you're like, you know what? Netflix isn't enough. Hulu isn't enough. I want to show my support. <laughs> I want to show my support for, you know, an amazing scholar that is helping me mm. see things in a way I never really thought about them or, mm. or you have others that you want to like sit down and have a popcorn night. Yeah. This is a perfect way of supporting the scholar that you love and, and having fun, having conversations after every video. Mm -hmm. To have friendly mm -hmm. dialogue. So like sitting in the living room or something like that, I can imagine having those great conversations. And uh, yeah. And I there. I mean, this is a sidebar, but there there is a leader's guide, but you, I can't put the leader's guide on the Vimeo website. So the leader's guide is on my um, personal website. Can I just read one snippet of the Please. one of the endorsements? On the book? Yeah. Is this too like, self-serving for me to do no, that? No, it is not. It's, I am a shameless plug in the right here. Okay. Where are we at? Yeah. I, yeah. So it's, it's the end of the, um, the Stephen Moore. Got it. Yeah. The Let last, zoom in so people can really the, the last two that. sentences I quoted all the time for like the first two or three years that I, um, when I would talk to people about it, um, I think he's, he's just a lovely human being by the way, but, um, this is so not I, so I, want me to read it. Sure. Or... Yeah. A great many academic biblical scholars trained to read the Bible critically previously read the Bible literally. Jennifer Grace Bird is one such scholar, but unlike most scholars, she is able to write about the Bible in ways that non academic Bible readers will find accessible, engaging and enlightening. This is not the only book of its kind, but to my mind, it is the best of its kind. Unusual for a work of biblical scholarship, it has the potential to transform non-academic lives. Mm. And the the best of it, the not the only book of its kind, um, he's referring to books by John Dominic Crossan and Bart Ehrman and Mar Marcus Borg, all beautiful, lovely human beings and really important scholarship. But that's just so you know, that's who he's, you know, kind of putting this in that category so i'm gonna i'm gonna do what you told me you don't like and that's put you on a pedestal for a second here but <laughs> i just i just want to say like it's it i think it helps having a female perception into this because yeah. i don't see the sensitivity on the subject matter like i do listening to you dr celine lily listening to candidate candidate moss listening yeah. to francesca stavrakapulu right like a woman's perception yeah. reading this patriarchal text you know you're gonna catch those little like whoa is that something that isn't patriarchal but also you're really gonna catch it if it is and so <laughs> i encourage people get the book you Thank also have the youtube channel too um tell us what you're trying to do with the youtube channel so we can help you well, thank you. At this point, I'm actually starting to release short videos, um, hopefully in the next couple of days. Does the Bible tell you so? Short, like just topics that people often ask about. So I'll be doing that. But at this point, I'm just trying to show some folks what I'm up to. So there are a couple different playlists on my channel. Um, but if you are following, then you'll you'll get this weekly little food for thought about what the Bible does and doesn't say on some of those big topics. Is it inerrant? You know, does what does the Bible say about original sin? All that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. So, thank you so much. And thank the you. last thing I plug because I'm a shameless plug and yes. I want to keep doing what I'm doing at Myth Vision. Join the Patreon. Listen, I'm talking to you, those who have sat on the fence or have listened to me say this before, and you go, I don't have a lot of money. It doesn't cost a lot. Um, you can join and access everything I have on MythVision's Patreon for $3 a month. Less than half of the cost of a Starbucks coffee. And you're, you're helping support a channel that really brings this content to you all the time. So yeah. with the Super Chats and with the, with the Patreon, that's how I'm able to do what I do full time. There is hundreds, I'm not exaggerating, hundreds of videos on the Patreon that you will access that are not made public on YouTube. You can access them there. Please go support us. Like this one's not public. This one's not public. This one is public. I just launched that one. This one's not public. That's John Dominic Crossan. Uh, this one's Robert G. Hoyland, one of the most well-known Western academics in Islamic studies. John Dominic Crossan again. And by the way, the quality is impeccable. I went mm -hmm. in person 
mm-hmm. made this one public. Um, this is a private snippet that I only gave to my Patreon members of me and Delcy Allison Jr. Aww. in his kitchen chatting yeah, about nice. Robin Faith Walsh's position on the Gospels. Huh, uh, cool. This one's not public. It's James D. Tabor. What kind of Jew was Jesus in a yeah. scene, Sadducee, Pharisee, Zealot? And nice. we go into what category? Can you pigeonhole the guy? Yeah. Like, just nice. on and on and on Zealot. and on and on. Yep. And you go down and then you hit load more. And wouldn't you know, oh, that one's not public. Uh, I did that one myself. That one, I really enjoyed that one. Comparing Caesar Augustus and Jesus and stuff. Mm-hmm. Like, but help us, please join the Patreon. Mm-hmm. Um, I got to give you the final word, though, because just like Lilith, she should have been able to be on top. <laughs> Um, tell us, Dr. Bird, <laughs> final words to our audience. Mm-hmm. Please tell us something. Well, I, the ultimate thing I want to say is the be honest about what it is saying when it and it puts women down. It puts women in second place. It puts women on the bottom. Um, but I don't think that women should be. I don't think, and I want people to be empowered. I want people, you know, I want women, all people all people, not just women, right? I'm not just a flip in the dynamic here. I want all people to be empowered and to know love and to be able to do what they need to do in the world. So I'm, I'm interested in helping people let go of anything about this text that has held them back. But I think it takes being honest about it first so that you can see that and then make that change. How's that? I seriously appreciate you. Yeah, no, this is great. And it, I'm learning more every day, thanks to you. And you, I hope Derek. our audience continues to learn more as well. Get her book, join the Patreon, <laughs> like the video, drop a comment. After the live, come back, drop me an algorithm comment. Just show something <laughs> in the chat. Share this out on social media so people can get educated and learn a thing or two. I think the world can use it, especially in the kind of situations that we fall into. Uh, I'm speaking specifically in America, of course, because it's where I'm at, but maybe you think it's need it everywhere and i hope so and never forget we are mythvision, mythvision. <laughs>